I am obviously not the beautiful, talented Angela Rye. I am Donald McEachin, and I have the privilege of being the congressman from Virginia's 4th Congressional District. And I'm just thrilled to see you all here today, so thank you for being here. And I think we need to start off with you, with you guys getting yourselves a round of applause for coming to this. You know, this is a um, panel that uh, means a lot to me. I think that the uh, environment is the most important issue of the 21st century. And we have got to get it right. We've got to get it right from everything in terms of our, the language that we Excuse use me. to talk about our movement to uh, the policies that we put in place. And it's my hope today that as we talk about environmental justice, we'll think about it in an expansive mode. It's not, we'll think of it in terms beyond just, and I don't mean to diminish this, but it's not just about bad water in certain communities. It's not just about bad air in certain communities, although those things are incredibly important. It's also about jobs in certain communities and the jobs that the environmental movement can bring. You know, all of us in here are here, most likely I dare say, because Preserving the environment is a core value. But if we're going to expand our movement, if we're going to expand this so that it gets to be a kitchen table issue, we've got to be able to tell folks what's in it for them. And again, I would suggest to you that it's jobs, it's good health, it's good living. And so uh, you all have a tall order to do. You've got a great panel here uh, to do it with. And I know that there's going to be some great thoughts that come out of this, uh, this, this conference today. Uh, I want to acknowledge, he may be here a little late, but I want to acknowledge the Dean of the Congress, and that is John Conyers. He's also a, yeah, give him a round of applause. We, we stand on his shoulders, and uh, it is an honor to be a co-chair of this conference with him. And now it's my honor to uh, bring up to the stage someone who absolutely needs no introduction, I'll say this, though, she is a former executive director of the Congressional Black Caucus. She makes us all proud every single time we see her on TV, and I'm proud to be with her today, and I know you all are too, the fabulous Angela Ray. Yesterday, I, um, I had to recognize the CBC members at this um, HBCU luncheon that was hosted at Microsoft, and I was like, I have to get his last name right. I have to get his last name right. And then, Mr. McKeechee, you just messed up my last name, and it's only three letters. <laughs> it's like, oh, sorry, I had to get you. It's rye like the bread or the whiskey, but I don't like whiskey. Anyway, good morning, everybody. We're a CBC family. We're good. We're good. We're good. I just had to tease them. You all are a little stiff this morning, I'm trying to lighten it up. Um, so anyway, I'm very happy to be here um, with this esteemed panel. I'm looking forward to learning um, about environmental justice issues. I'm looking forward to leaving this conversation with solutions. Uh, we spend a lot of time conferencing, y'all, like we do church. We have to go get a good word and go home and forget about all of the great things we learned. And so I hope today the panelists will join me in ensuring that we issue you a call to action whether it's one where you're pushing your members of Congress or your local elected officials or state elect elected officials to do something to address the environmental concerns that we are literally seeing happening right before our eyes. Um, you know, climate change is a real thing. That's not a fake news point. That's a real thing. Um, and I know I don't have to do any convincing in this room. So with that, um, I want to go ahead and get started and introduce our panel. So we have... Ms. Daryl Alexander, who is the director of AFT's Health and Safety. Uh, we welcome you, Daryl. Um, and before serving as the director of AFT's Health and Safety, Ms. Alexander was the program director. She also worked at the University of California at Berkeley's Labor Occupational Health Program. Ms. Alexander has published numerous articles on health and safety issues in schools healthcare facilities, and other workplaces. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Let's give a round of applause. And we have my good friend, 
Mustafa Santiago Ali, who is now the Senior Vice President of Climate, Environmental Justice, and Community Revitalization for the Hip Hop Caucus. We are so grateful to be joined by him today. Um, I'm going to put a plug in here. He was an impact leader of the month back in the day when we first started our nonprofit. Um, and it's been amazing to see his star rise before joining the caucus, Mr. Ali served as the Assistant Associate Administrator for Environmental Justice and, C and the Senior Advisor for Environmental Justice and Community Revitalization at the EPA. Woo! That was a mouthful. <laughs> but he's all that. That title is good because he's all that. At the EPA, Mr. Ali elevated environmental justice issues and worked across federal agencies to strengthen environmental justice policies, programs, and initiatives. He is a renowned national speaker, trainer, and facilitator specializing in social justice issues focused on revitalizing our most vulnerable communities. Let's give Mr. Ali a hand. <laughs> Next, we have Laureen Bowles. Very good. I'm not trying to mess up a name after I just called out Mr. McEachin for that. <laughs> I, would, I would love to introduce you to her. She's the state director of the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance. Under Ms. Bowles' leadership, the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance and its partners on the Newark Climate Resiliency Action Plan won the Resource Efficiency Award from Plan Smart New Jersey. Congratulations. Ms. Bowles' background also includes more than 25 years of sustainable community development experience as a civil engineer and environmental planner for the city of Philadelphia. Welcome, Maureen. And she's a civil engineer. That's where the double round of applause. Y'all got to wake up. It's not that early. And I thought we were supposed to stay woke or whatever, right? <laughs> Lighten up, y'all. Okay. Miss Leslie Fields, the Director of Environmental Justice and Community Partnerships Program at the Sierra Club. Welcome. We are so excited to have you here. Miss Fields has over 20 years of federal, state, local, and an international environmental justice and environmental law and policy experience. Ms. Fields was appointed by President Obama to serve on the board of directors of the Mickey Leland Urban Air Toxics Research Center. She is also served on, or also serves on the board of the Children's Environmental Health Network and the board of, I'm gonna mess this up, Adi, Adi, Adi so? uh, Adesso. Adesso African Solutions. I messed something up. He can get me back for this later. He left already. Okay, and can we please give a round of applause? Thank you. <laughs> Damian Jones. Mr. Damian Jones is the environmental justice outreach advocate at the Union of Concerned Scientists. In his role, Mr. Jones works to increase access to solar power in communities of color and in low-income communities and on policy reforms that can support coastal communities facing permanent inundation. Before joining UCS, Mr. Jones served as the as a Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Program Coordinator of the Leadership Institute. CBC fam, <laughs> Mr. Jones is a veteran of the U.S. Air Force host of the hashtag TY4YL podcast. What does that stand for, Damien? Thank you for your leadership. Uh-oh. <laughs> Thank you for your leadership podcast. And a motivational speaker on leadership and social justice. Welcome, Damien, to the panel. Ms. Telva Magruder, Director of Global Facilities Engineering and Manufacturing Operations at GM General Motors. Uh, at GM, Ms. Magruder leads the teams responsible for forward-looking strategy and implementation of expert technical solutions that create value for GM employees and communities in which they operate. Additionally, her team coordinates comprehensive facility management activities focused on ongoing delivery of the solution sets that lead GM to a more sustainable future. We look forward to hearing from Ms. Magruder. Welcome to the panel. And last but certainly not least, we have Ms. Jacqueline Patterson, who's the Director of Environmental and Climate Justice Program at the NAACP. Since 2007, Ms. Patterson has served as coordinator and co-founder of Women of Color United. Ms. Patterson has worked as a researcher, program manager, coordinator, advocate, and activist working on women's rights, violence against women, HIV and AIDS, racial justice, economic justice, environmental and climate justice. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. 
And in case you all missed it, um, I was a former uh, CBC executive director, and I know what I'm supposed to be doing right now, and that is to defer to the dean of the house, dean also of the caucus, a CBC founder, ranking member on the J Judiciary Committee. He is not gonna come up here. He's going to talk from his seat. This is Congressman John Conyers. Top of the morning, everybody. Angela Rye, you are fabulous. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. Here we are, another year. And we're together here on the Environmental Justice Brain Trust. Now, environmental protections will be a defining issue in our country and our community for decades, for decades to come. And you know, there's, there's some conservatives in the Congress that are still arguing about uh, whether we have, uh, whether we need environmental protection. They're busy taking away regulations and controls and requirements uh, when we should be looking at them even more carefully. In our communities, we cannot succeed if in places like Detroit, my hometown of course, 10% of our children have high levels of lead in their blood, 10%. And so this becomes a serious immediate problem of great magnitude. Uh, some of our schools are literally making children too sick to learn. Or what about Houston and New Orleans where our homes are wiped out by climate change? Uh, uh, which is dri driven by storms. We must address each of these issues of our community if uh, we are to thrive. And, and this requires a broad coalition. And that's why I, I like the makeup, not only of this very distinguished panel, who have all been developing their perspective and, and are going to share it with us this morning. But the coalition must stretch from sea to sea, sea to shining sea, from the classroom to the streets, to the boardroom, to our nation's capital. We need to have conversations to help us plan a new future conversations like we're having today right here in this building. I want to offer special greetings uh, to all my friends uh, from General Motors as the congressman from the Motor City. It's an honor to have you here. Now General Motors, of course, is a great American company their success in Detroit helped us build uh, the first mile of road, create a middle class, win a world war, and create opportunity for millions of Americans. Now, though, I want to commend them on their newest success, the Chevy Bolt, the first affordable mass-produced electric car in history, and a truly fine automobile, which won the 2017 Motor Trend Car of the Year Award. This is the sort of ingenuity uh, we are known for in Detroit and in America, and that is the sort of ingenuity that we need to succeed. Thank you for being here. Thank you, panelists, for all the work many of you have done for years on this subject. I'm eager to hear from you and to do what we can uh, to address the problems that face us together. The Congressional Black Caucus is going to be very interesting in the discussions that come out of this panel. Mustafa Ali. 
Telva McGruder, Leslie Fields, Jacqueline, Pat Jacqueline Patterson, Damian Jones, Lorene Bowles, Daryl Alexander. Thank you all, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Conyers. Okay, so let's start with, um, I think what's kind of immediately before us, we know Puerto Rico right now is being hit um, by a, yet another hurricane. I can't think of um, a time, and maybe it's, you know, just my memory, but I can't think of a time where we've been hit by more natural disasters that are so strong in uh, their demolition and the challenges that they're creating for human life. And so I really want to talk through some of the recent devastation of uh, the hurricane in Puerto Rico, Harvey, Irma, um, and everything that is going on from a climate change perspective. Mr. Conyers just touched on climate change as well. Um, we know that natural disasters are continuing to become a problem, and they're increasing again in their amount of in the amount of devastation that they're that they're causing. How does climate change exacerbate environmental injustice? Because we know that these are also hitting communities of color the hardest, the communities that couldn't prepare and as a result aren't prepared, that may live in homes that are less secure, and as a result they'll have a harder time, harder time rebuilding those homes. Can we touch a little bit on environmental injustice um, and climate change given what's happening immediately before us? And that can go to anyone who wants to answer or I'll call on you. <laughs> well, I thought that we had someone up here that did a leadership podcast. Oh, okay. I was getting ready to call. You got lucky. Why not? <laughs> well, you know, Angela, as you mentioned, um, the communities, EJ communities, low-income and minority communities are less likely to be able to um, withstand extreme weather. Mm -hmm. um, most of us aren't able to, but they're less likely to. Um, and so because they have less access to secure health care, secure housing, and even job determining uh, or, or self-determining jobs. Um, I, I recall I, I met this woman who, um, she lost her job. She said, this is going to be the last day that you see me here because she was required to come to work on a day where we were expecting 21 inches of snow. She was on public transit. And so, because, so when we're talking about, um, uh, and, and that's exactly what happened. That was the last day that I saw her. Um, and so we're talking about uh, communities who have less access to health care, less access to secure housing, and less access to self-determining jobs. She couldn't make a decision whether to stay at home, take care of her kids who were out of school, or come to, or come to work. And that's the situation that most of those communities are in. Could I just add something? So for our communities, communities of color, low-income communities, and indigenous populations, the combination of environmental injustices and climate change provide a, a double whammy, if you will. The reality that's going on on the ground inside of our communities is that the fossil fuel uh, facilities, those greenhouse gas facilities, whether we're talking about coal-fired power plants, or we're talking about petrochemical corporations, are located in our communities, and it's not a mistake that they are inside of our communities. It goes directly to the planning and the zoning, and it also goes to the policy that's in place. So what you find is that when these impacts happen, as the sister said, that folks don't have the ability to escape, because in some instances you don't have access to transportation, or the planning process has not taken you into account of the need that exists inside that space. We saw that in Katrina, and we continue to see that in many cities around the country. The also, the other things that happen are Superfund sites. Those Superfund sites in many instances are located next to our communities. When these floods come, it begins to move the sediment. The water moves those into backyards, into schoolyards, into other places. So not only are folks dealing with these injustices on a daily basis uh, of the impacts uh, of these toxins, but then they are magnified uh, when these storms happen. Also, when these plants begin to do start up and shut down, they push huge amounts of pollution into these communities. Communities like the Manchester community in Houston, Texas, as folks have heard me talk about, when you go there and you roll your windows down, you literally feel like you are breathing gasoline fumes. Mm -hmm. This is a daily basis, and our students are supposed to learn in these situations, save up Cesar Chavez High School was right there. So then when the storms come, they have a justification for being able to push this pollution out. The communities who are trying to escape then are impacted by that, and then if folks are blessed to be able to come back home, 
the plants are starting up again, so then you have another burst of this pollution. Um, so you have this cumulative effect that's happening inside of communities. The other thing that I just will plant the seed, and maybe we'll talk about this as we move forward, is to also look how wealth is extracted from our communities. Because in many instances, after these storms come, then people can't return home. People then buy that property cheaper. Mm -hmm. Then they redevelop it, uh, and they get all the sort of benefits now inside of this community after they have moved communities of color away, um, after they've moved low-income communities away. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. And Mustafa, I said earlier that um, this was going to be a learning opportunity for me, too. And so I know there are probably some of us in here that aren't environmental justice or climate change um, um, uh, experts. So you, said, you talked about Superfund sites. What is that? Superfund sites are some of the most toxic, deadly sites around the country. There's all kinds of chemicals, <laughs> cancer-causing chemicals, other chemicals that are devastating to the body that are inside of these um, locations. And they can be anything. They can come from old mines. They can come from folks who've left drums sitting around. There's so many different things that can come. But if you go and look at any of the literature, so the things that we're going to talk about here today on this panel, this is not theory. This is not supposition. This is the reality of what's going on. So those Superfund sites, um, they exist and they're the most toxic. So that's one of the reasons that you should be concerned because if you're exposed to these chemicals, then many, in many instances you're being exposed to cancer-causing chemicals and other chemicals that can cause great harm to your body. Last follow-up on this. Can you give us an example of one or two of these? Like, where are they? Can you think of... They're like, they're like, I can give you a thousand of them. I told you I'm trying to get educated. I don't know if I'm the only one, but I want to make sure that if I'm going to be an advocate, I know exactly what I'm advocating for, and I know I'm not just dropping Mustafa words. I know what they mean, right? So I'm just trying to get educated. If y'all are past me, tell me to move on. But if not, let me find out where they are. But Daryl wanted to say something. Okay, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, we've been working with our affiliate uh, in, in Birmingham, Alabama. And for those of you who don't know much about Birmingham, Alabama, there is a community there, North Birmingham, that is poor and black, uh, that has been inundated with chemicals, one of which is a big Superfund site that's like literally next door to the school and to an apartment complex where people live. And uh, if that's their day-to-day -day reality, uh, the contaminants coming uh, that are polluting the, the water, um, uh, polluting the soil that the children play on uh, every day. Uh, EPA has been doing a too quiet study about North Birmingham because it's not only the Superfund site, it's uh, uh, contaminants from cars and diesel engines because they're surrounded by freeways, uh, they're down <coughs> from plants. And I know Ms. Mustafa mentioned C uh, Cesar Chavez uh, in uh, Houston. We fought against that. That school didn't need to be there in the first place. They mm -hmm. built that school mm -hmm. right uh, in an industrial uh, sector and put those children in that community at further risk. I just wanted to add, um, I just got back from Houston and Port Arthur the other night. And for those of you from that community, um, you know about all the, the, indus the industrial situation there, as Mustafa and Daryl mentioned. Um, I, you know, every time I think I've seen it all, I haven't seen it all. And so in, um, as Mustafa said, in Port Arthur, you have the Motiva refinery. It's the largest refinery in North America. Not just the United States, but in North America. And... Um, it has been, it was flare, is flaring and gassing as we speak. It's also flooded. The parking lot was flooded. I drove by and the parking lot is a lake. The rest of it is fenced off so you can't really get in there. And the, um, the situation there is, is terrible. Um, and I, I'm still trying to process it. And um, there was so much flooding there and so many people have lost their homes um, people who are in public housing have been kicked out. They're being put in tent cities. They, um, and they are bringing, pulling up the debris and they're dumping it into the black neighborhood and we're trying to, looking at some legal action about that. We saw that before with many other storms. Um, you know, when you have landfills, you have different classifications of landfills. So you have municipal landfills, C and D landfills, you have hazardous waste landfills. You don't just take everything and dump it in the landfill. We don't do that anymore. Um, Houston is um, 
went back to Manchester, went back to that. That community was flaring all the time as well. And it's not just that, that soil and sediment. That was raw sewage. That was chemicals. That was solvents. That was gasoline. That is some, I have a terrible um, rash on my arm just for being there, you know, two days. Oh um, so people are trying to pick up their lives. There's, the kids' school buses were, you know, contaminated. The kids' schools are contaminated and they're trying to get the kids back to school because they're trying to get them back into a routine. And so, um, you know, there's really, um, people have to understand that the sacrifice stones of this country are our communities and that climate change acerbates all inequalities. It's a threat multiplier. And so this is, you know, and what's going on in Puerto Rico, um, we have a fantastic chapter there and we have a great organizer there. We haven't heard from them yet. Um, the whole island of Vieques is a super fun site. Why? Because it was bombed. It was used as a bombing range by the US military. The whole island. So all of this stuff that gets spread out, now it's in everybody's neighborhood, all right? So you have a situation in Houston now, all this contamination is in everybody's neighborhood. And we're gonna talk about, you know, one of the good questions was about how do we, you know, get people, everybody else to understand that. So, you know, it starts in our neighborhood, but if you don't address the most vulnerable, mm -hmm. everybody gets affected. That's right. Yeah. Angela, may, may I add something mm -hmm. really quick? Um, just to, to piggyback with, Others have said, you know, these extreme weather events, um, they don't care where you come from. They don't care your walk of life. And we see with the hurricanes, Maria, um, Katrina, Harvey, others, they wash away family heirlooms. They, you lose your home, you lose cars, you lose many things. But also what uh, was revealed to me is that these hurricanes wash away the, the mass of what's happening in this country in terms of poverty and inequality, right? And so let me give you some numbers. The average median income for African Americans is $36,000. 25% of African Americans live below the poverty level. Four million African Americans don't have health insurance. So you think about these medical maladies that Leslie just talked about. If folk don't have health insurance, how can they recover from these things? So these storms affect us today, but 10, 12 years down the road, you still will feel the effects of it. 200,000 people were displaced by Hurricane Katrina majority of those folk uh, are African American. And guess who suffers the most? Our children who get displaced, have to get comfortable with a new situation, with uh, new teachers and so forth. So it affects us all across the board, from a medical standpoint, from an educational standpoint, from a poverty standpoint as well. It's, it's very, very impactful. So I just wanted to add a couple of things over here. Sure. We'll just keep going down the line. So you know, I'll echo what Leslie said. What we really need to talk about and the perspective that General Motors takes is what can we do? Mm -hmm. and, and one thing we've learned a lot over the years, you know, years ago we weren't the company that we are today. And the company that we are today, we constantly look at what we can do because there is devastation that it impacts our communities um, in a way that's it's definitely not proportional to the way it may impact others because of the, the previously existing conditions. So, so when we look at what we can do, what we need to do is have a discussion on that. We focus on decreasing the recovery gap. You know, we focus on giving money, in this case, to, to, to organizations that we know care about rebuilding communities the way they were and, and not necessarily in, in bringing others into the community. So Habitat, Habitat for Humanity is, is a company we ally with because we believe that they believe in, in what we believe in to rebuild communities. And so we constantly look at how to, how to decrease that gap because the devastation is so large. And so I look forward to that, that conversation because it's, it's a really big one. How do we teach people to look at things that way? Yeah, so I just wanted to add, and, and I'm glad you took us to solutions because um, that actually takes me um, away from what I was going to say a little bit, but it helps me to frame it a little bit. So, uh, so I, I want, I, using that point, I want to talk about how we need to really be intersectional and, and holistic in uh, how we deal with, with these challenges. And with that, I, I was going to point out some of the subpopulations. So we talk about the community level disproportionate impact and, and, and differential vulnerability that our communities were in as they face these disasters. Then there's certain populations 
organizations and individuals within within our communities, such as um, people with disabilities, for example, who are disproportionately so there's double jeopardy. So you're already perhaps living in poor uh, poor housing stock, or you're already facing um, poverty s situations, and then you you might have a special health need or a disability that then hampers you from being able to to evacuate in the same way that other folks are able to evacuate. And uh, also looking at immigration, a lot of times when we look at um, immigration and look at special ac access for people who are from other nations living in the country, it's, it's, it's usually focused on Latino populations. And so when we talk about language access, there's a big push in, with FEMA, for example, to have things in Spanish. But the last community I vi visited when I was in, um, when I was in Florida in the post Irma situation was a Haitian community who 10 <laughs> days after the disaster hadn't been visited by the Red Cross, didn't even know that FEMA was out there and they had resources mm -hmm. for them, had no idea. And they were, we had a few sandwiches in, in, a, in, a, in some brown paper bags and they fell on us like they were, they were in a desert. Mm -hmm. And um, because they just didn't have any, they didn't have roofs on half of the buildings in the community. They had blue tarps trying to cover the roofs and but rain would come and then sparks would start flying. And these were the conditions they were in 10 days after the disaster while other people were getting back on their feet. Women also disproportionately impacted, whether it's women after Hurricane Katrina who were facing um, um, an increase in domestic violence and sexual violence, people who are living in prisons who were abandoned after Hurricane Katrina, for example, and in this situation recently, in going to solutions, there was a, 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 concert, a concerted effort to make sure that the first folks the folks got in, in touch with were the prison um, people who were um, in charge of prisons to make sure that the proper um, resources were in place. Our criminal justice program was part of making sure that our, our NAACP leaders knew to ask for that. So just wanted to kind of point out the need for that those intersectional strategies and really looking at even the most vulnerable within our communities um, who are disproportionately impacted. Thank you. And in that same vein, um, I'm sorry, was there anyone else I missed? No? Good. Um, in that same vein, um, I think for a lot of us, um, what happened in Flint and it being so visible um, in the media was a rude awakening for just how disastrous some of these challenges in our communities can be. Um, I do want to talk about the Flint water crisis and the Dakota Access Pipeline, but because um, we oftentimes don't hear or see these stories that, Leslie, for example, what you talked about and Mustafa, what you talked about, we don't see that on TV. We don't see that on a YouTube video or on Snapchat or Instagram. Sometimes we can get good news sources on Instagram. But we don't see them. And so I want to talk about some of those places that are less visible to us because many of us are going home to places that maybe that aren't Flint, that aren't in, you know, any, either of the Dakotas and maybe, and maybe not even Houston, which has been brought to light today. But we have, maybe there are issues in our own backyards that we could be addressing. So if we could for a moment give some examples of other less known Flints, I think that would be a great starting point and then we can move on to well, um, let me just begin with uh, the issue of lead and lead in schools and lead in communities. Uh, we have not had any kind of real federal leadership on the question of uh, lead contaminated water uh, in our communities and schools. So what we have is a hodgepodge of uh, reaction here in the District of Columbia. Uh, we've had issues with the old pipes and uh, lead contaminated water in homes and schools. And uh, that started about uh, 25 years ago when I first moved here. And to this day, there is no program to systematically uh, measure levels in homes to study and monitor it, uh, it because they didn't replace all the, the pipes uh, in homes. And uh, the D.C. is a, a better, you know, like place for trying to deal with this. Uh, most other uh, cities, uh, school districts um, don't have any kind of plan to, you know, uh, cover this. The EPA regulations that require water systems to do some testing are not well monitored uh, at all. So, you know, we've got a lot of hidden lead contamination all over the place. Uh, we dealt with Newark, New Jersey uh, two years ago and the water there, Trenton, New Jersey. I mean, La Laureen probably does a lot of work 
on, on lead contamination. And, and um, uh, these, are, these are huge issues for us. Uh, why doesn't the federal government provide more incentives for um, communities and especially old communities to do better monitoring of lead levels in homes and schools. Uh, after Flint, uh, there was some, some effort to give states some money and to sort of beg them to use it uh, to do that. Uh, New York State's the only state I know of that sort of put something in process, okay, school districts, you have to test for lead <coughs> and you have to follow a good standard to do that. Um, it, it's a huge issue, and um, it, 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 it's, you know, as Flint receives uh, from the headlines, so do, the, does our comprehensive concern for this issue. I mean, you can look anywhere from East Chicago um, to the lead impacts that are happening there to Washington, D.C., who just a few years ago also had significant issues with lead in the water to Baltimore. I mean, you can literally go around the country. So if you want to look at lead in schools, every state has a issue in that sort of arena. There, there's not one state that does it that I've found, and, and maybe there may be one that I've missed. Um, in relationship to the pipelines, um, all of us know about the no dapple um, sort of movement that's going on. But there are pipelines. If you had a map right now and literally showed you the pipelines that are running through our country, and that's the amazing part. One. That, that map would be filled with pipelines. It's amazing, I just looked at one the other day. But besides that, that this administration thinks that it's important to create new pipelines. So what kind of sense does that make? None, nothing they do makes sense. Sorry, I know it's not my turn, but yes. sorry, yes. carry on. But let me just add something. So these pipelines also that are carrying you know, this energy source that we no longer actually need also end up in our communities. So Leslie talked about Port Arthur, Texas. Well, the pipelines with the tar sands are supposed to be moving straight into that community. So not only are they being impacted by the petrochemical facilities that exist there, but now they also have these pipelines that are moving this. And we know, again, this is not theory, that pipelines leak. And when they leak, they create disasters. Whether they're small or medium-sized or large, they are still. And then we have to find the responsible party um, or it comes from your tax dollars. So many of the things that we are talking about today, people are using your tax dollars to abuse your communities. Mm -hmm. And we allow that to happen. And we allow that to happen when we don't get engaged in the process. So all of these issues, whether we're talking about lead, or we're talking about Superfund sites, or we're talking about air pollution, or we're talking about pipelines, all of these things, people are making huge amounts of money and extracting money from you at the same time, along with your health. But some people don't pay attention to their health. But when you start talking about people's pocketbooks, then you get their attention. People start to sit up a little, little straighter and want to hear what's going on. And that's why it's important that we have this economic conversation also about the revitalization that needs to happen in our communities, but also how people are utilizing your tax dollars to impact your communities. One of the things about the oil pipelines, and there's a lot of them, as Mustafa said, is that this oil is for export. This is not our oil. All right, this oil is going, going, coming down from wherever, coming to Cushing, Oklahoma, which is where it all kind of gets coupled, and then goes to the Gulf and gets loaded on tankers. So just to understand that we're not, you know, this is not the oil that you're, you're getting from your gas, you know, when you go to the gas station. And this oil is going to China. The Panama Canal was widened. So you see all these port communities which are also people of color communities being impacted by all the ports that are being widened because the Panama Canal is being widened. So this is all going for export. There is the Bayou Bridge Pipeline, which is going from western Louisiana over across the Atchafalaya, across to St. James Parish, which is Cancer Alley. Have, how, who knows about Cancer Alley? Who knows about Cancer Alley? You know, Cancer Alley from Baton Rouge to New Orleans, 50 miles of chemical petrochemical plants, and what we call a cancer rally is because those plants were cited in those African American communities after their historic communities after um, they've been enslaved. And so you can take a map of all the former plantations and you can lay over all those facilities and those communities and those chemical plants. And so there's the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, there's the Trans-Picos Pipeline. There's a pipeline that's going to go across Georgia 
those of you from Georgia, basically land them in the backyard of Congressman Sanford Bishop's church. All right, so it doesn't matter how you know, renowned you are, whether you're a congressperson or whether, you know, it's still gonna go in your community. And um, you have fracking in the black community in Fort Worth, you have fracking in the black communities in Pennsylvania, and so all this is going out for export. And that's what we need to understand about the financial situation. Um, we are not benefiting from it, and we're paying in many ways. You're paying because they got tax abatements, they got, mm -hmm. they got all kinds of goodies. You're paying with your health, and you're paying for the cleanup when it, when, if, they, if it happens to be it spilled or blow up. So you're paying three or four ways, but you're not getting any of the benefits. Really quick um, on the economic piece, um, and we can go back on this in a second, but I really think this is important. One, because every single Congress, Congressman Conyers introduces HR 40, which is just to study, have a commission set up to study reparations and the need for it, whether or not there's a case for it. So I know this isn't reparations, but ta Coates wrote a piece making the case for reparations just on housing. We know there have been lead settlements for people in homes, but Mustafa and Leslie, you all touched a little bit on schools. I'm sorry, and Daryl touched on schools, lead in schools. If we're paying for it, Leslie, to your last point, when do, how do we ensure that our kids who have suffered for decades, right? Some, now some of our parents, maybe some of our peers, have suffered for decades as a result of lead poisoning, as a result of lead <coughs> impacting their bodies, how do we build a case that says, well, y'all don't think we deserve reparations for slavery until they consider Mr. Conyers' bill, but maybe you, we can demonstrate a clear case of the consequences that exist, not just in homes, but in schools? It's a really good question. Leslie rolled her eyes at me. No, I didn't roll I'm thinking. <laughs> you know, that to prove causation is very mm -hmm. difficult. Um, but, you know, there are some... I mean, we can look at the tobacco settlement cases. We can look at mm -hmm. asbestos. I mean, asbestos cases, there's a lot of tort law involved. But asbestos is interesting because you don't, get a, you don't develop mesothelioma until like decades right. later. Okay, it's in your body. I had a friend who worked as a dock worker, Grover Hankins, who was the general counsel for the NAACP in the 90s and a dear friend. He worked as a dock worker as a teenager and developed mesothelioma as, and when he was about seven years old, and they couldn't figure out what it was, and they had to go way back you know, through his history. Now, that shipyard's gone in Chicago. That's part of the problem. So there's, there's ways to look at that. I'm not, um, but I think that, that we have to, you know, the testing and the research needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I mean, the thing is, is that we can improve our health. We can create pipelines for water and sewer and create jobs. You know, it's not not pipelines per se, it's that what is in the pipelines that's not benefiting us, mm -hmm. right? And so in terms of, and working with the unions and you know, those kinds of important jobs. Um, but um, we don't have to say that we're against everything, but we're against things that we are not benefiting from, right? right? So we have to find that you, know, that you would have to create some kind of causation and prove, you know, to demonstrate that this, this condition was created by this harm. Right. It's hard. Where are my lawyers, though, in the audience? Okay, okay. I, mean, I need y'all to have passed the bar. I don't do this kind of work. Okay, but seriously, I'm saying we need to spend some time. This is an action item point. I want you to spend some time figuring out how these folks have a ton of resources. Who are the researchers that can help establish this? They're not trying to get, especially under this administration, they don't want us to have no reparations, y'all. So we need to make sure that our folks are whole, are made whole, especially when they were put in direct harm's way, even with their taxpayer dollars, I mean, right? They've been led, you know, there was, there was a big case in Baltimore mm -hmm. um, a few years ago, the Kennedy Krieger Institute. Um, it's a long story. Mm -hmm. um, and how they used the black families as a control and they didn't tell them about that they were being supposed to let. And it was Freddie Gary's family exactly. who was part of that um, settlement. So he was poisoned as a child. Right. Okay. He was poisoned, you know, he was killed by lead, you know, many times. And so um, they're there and died at the hands of the police. Um, but the, um, so that. That situation, you know, they got a settlement out of that. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on the. the case. When I went, literally, I asked the question because when Mustafa said Baltimore, mm -hmm. I thought of the Freddie Gray case, yeah. and then that triggered the Tanahasi thing and Mr. Conyers. But I think Leslie mentioned Freddie Gray. 
We can also think about core and gains as well. But I, I think we can talk about how this affects our children. So let's go back to lead. I'm from Jackson, Mississippi, and so um, there's a ton of lead uh, in houses in Jackson, Mississippi, in Baltimore, in Detroit, and other places. Um, but our children, they get jacked up on lead early on, um, in the water, uh, in their houses, how they ingest it, and what does it do? It affects their brain, right? These are, we're talking about black kids. Once it gets into their brain, maybe they become a, a problem child uh, in the school. Maybe they are diagnosed with ADHD and jacked up on pills as well. And then what happens? They're in school suspension, maybe they're suspended, and then they're truancy. And truancy leads to what, people? Prison, right? So this is an issue. We can connect these things, EJ and CJ as well. So when you talk about Angelo, how do we paint the picture to folk? Um, as to how we can get more policies and show how it's affecting us, it's di directly affecting our children early on. Once they get exposed to lead, more than likely they're going to end up in jail. And that, and that aids more to the mass incarceration system. So we've got to make the connection between those two things. So it's killing our children. Uh, could, could I just add, you know, here we are again with just a regulatory uh, jumble. The requirement to test children for lead is not universal. Uh, children who are in Medicaid get tested at 12 and 24 months, but the, a lot of those children fall through the, 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 the... So if we could just get a requirement that children be tested for lead at regular intervals throughout their early life when they're the most vulnerable, that would be a step to getting to, you know, Leslie's point, proving that, you know, their lead exposure is associated with, you know, like lifelong detriment. And, and, and so, you know, it's really tragic that in a country like this, something like lead, we have not come up with a consistent state and federal <coughs> regulatory system that tries to capture what's happening to people. And maybe we can expand this to other environmental uh, hazards that people in our communities are exposed to on a daily basis. Just let me say this, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to keep hitting on this point, extraction of wealth from our communities. Mm -hmm. If you have someone who's exposed to lead, then you have to make sure they're in the public health system, if you will, and that they're getting treatment that costs. When folks can't learn, as Damien said, then that means that they're probably not going to become a high income earner. So that, again, is extraction of wealth from our communities. And it plays out on and on when you go to prison. So let's not act like there's not some strategy behind some of these actions right. that are going on. When you go to prison, now they got somebody who will work for pennies on the dollar. So you don't have to pay somebody else to do those jobs because now you have relatively free labor. So there is, as Jackie says, interconnectivity. There is, uh, you know, uh, with these issues that we're focusing on. And we really need to not stay woke, but be woke, as I've heard Angela say. No, work woke. Work woke. There it is. Um, so if we're not doing that and understanding that there is a strategy out there for the things that are happening, then we are doing a disservice to our folks. I just wanted to add that there are strategies and there are systems in place, and, and, which we are aware of. Mm -hmm. And then there are some that we're not aware of. Um, and one I want to bring light to, to what um, Leslie said about the cancer alleys and things not happening by accident. So in city planning, they teach us how to cite an industry. Look for a community with low voter turnout. Mm -hmm. Look for a community that's politically marginalized. Are y'all listening to this? Yes. Look for a community with a lot of churches. Look for a community with majority, minority populations. And it was a list that went on maybe 10 things that we were supposed to look for. Lorene, I need you to say it all over again. Z, I need you to put this on Instagram because we're going to make, and I'm serious, I want y'all to repost this video because we're going to make this go viral because we need our folks to understand. Stay woke, be woke, work woke, whatever. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but this is important. So we stay in, at this conference every year telling people to go vote. People are like, why do I have to go vote? Not y'all, because you guys come here, but you go back home to your cousins, friends, mom and them that don't want to go vote because they don't think the system represents them. You have to represent the system. She's telling you 
how they plan this for us. Mustafa's hit on this. We have to get this. We have to walk out with an action in our bodies, our spirits, our hearts, and move. Laureen, please preach to us and tell us what's going on. One more time. I'm sorry, but like it hit me. I had goosebumps. I, we need this. Please. How to cite an industry. You're talking about communities who have low voter turnout, communities with majority minority populations, communities with a lot of churches, and they didn't have to put a label on the top of it. I knew exactly who they were talking about when I read the community. I grew up in one of those yes. communities, okay? Uh, there are a lot of communities around the country who wonder why things happen. Why, are there's, why is there a cancer alley? There are cancer alleys in every city. There are 23 cities in New Jersey with water worse than Flint. Study came out right after Flint, okay? And so, you know, these are issues that we have to address. We have to address the strategies that Mustafa talked about, but the systems that are in place to fail us. They're doing exactly what they're designed to do to fail us. 23 cities in New Jersey with water worse than Flint. <sighs> okay. I'm sorry, we didn't get this whole panel on this, and I'm like, I'm stuck. Lorene has me, like, all the way jacked up right now. <laughs> in a good way, like, you know, again, it's like, you know, when an alarm bell just goes off, you know, and you think you have so many other important other issues to deal with, and at every turn we're fighting the administration on something. This is something that didn't start with this Trump administration. Right. This is something that's been happening in our communities for years, and where have we been on this? Anyway, yes, <laughs> okay, <laughs> please. So I'm going to, uh, you know, absolutely acknowledge everything we've been talking about. Everything we've been talking about is absolutely true. The question is, we need, you know, parallel paths are important. So acknowledging the situation, being aware of the situation, you know, being woke to the situation and willing to work in it is extremely important. And, and working parallel paths is important in that, in that case. So the question becomes for those communities, for people that live in those communities like the one that I grew up in, how do we teach people to deal with the situation that they're in? And how do we bring, and we do this in many different ways through CBC and many other organizations, but how do we bring the resources to people to help them keep themselves as healthy as possible in that situation? Okay, so I'm just going to give an example. And of course I'm here really talking about GM's commitment to the community and to sustainability, okay? So, you know, one of the things we do in Detroit is we get old shipping containers and we put fresh dirt in them and we teach students in the schools in Detroit to grow their own vegetables. And we have urban gardens, and we have urban gardens in a lot of communities, and one of them is Detroit. And we have volunteers from our company that ally with, with other companies in the city and with schools and we teach students, and we have them come, and they come during school, during lunch, after school, and they plant, and they grow, and they take the food home, and we create more vegetables out of these urban gardens than they can afford to buy in the stores. So what happens if the soil is contaminated, though? Because what we're talking about today are... Yeah, yeah. so what we're talking about, so this particular example, mm -hmm. when we talk about sustainability, and, and creating something that can take care of itself, as we're talking about having soil from outside of the community in containers that are not in the ground so that they can grow their vegetables in clean soil and eat vegetables that aren't contaminated, right? So, and it's in the middle of the city. Um, so the soil is, you know, in some areas absolutely contaminated. That has to be handled. In the meantime, what do we do? And that's something that, you know, we're committed to paying attention to, and it's something that all commit communities should be committed to paying attention to, and what can we do in the communities that we're in so that we can move forward, okay? So, you know, you can't change everything overnight. So what does the parallel path look like? This is an example, an idea. We have several examples like that of things that we do, but it's certainly something we're thinking about and talking about. The problem is huge. You know, you may sit, be sitting there saying, you know, well, that's just some little thing that that company is doing. But when we teach people, now I can talk about students that I've met that are able to help themselves and they're able to talk about what they've learned in these gardens and are able to get themselves 100% scholarships to universities so they can be part of the solution to the problems we're talking about today. And they've done that because we've invested in them, because we've shown we care about them and we've helped them to stay healthy on the, along that way. So all of this is important and we should, we should um, be aware that while it's bad, it's not hopeless. 
So earlier this year, we put out a report called Lights Out in the Cold, Reforming Utility Shutoff Policies as if Human Rights Matter. And we really put it out as a result of seeing the number of families who, were, who had passed away due to having their electricity cut off and have, using, uh, using everything from um, space heaters to heat their homes to, to that, that, that ended up burning down their homes, using candles to light their homes, and, and using um, carbon dioxide, I mean, using um, generators to, to power their homes, which ended up resulting in carbon dioxide, monoxide poisoning, monoxide poisoning. And so we see where this, there, we have 68% uh, of African Americans living within 30 miles of a coal fired power plant and all of these other toxic things that are toxic um, plants that are used to create energy, but yet we're, we're more likely to not actually have access to the energy that's created while it's polluting us and, and causing these various impacts that we've talked about. Similarly, and so this is where we see kind of the impacts of the, the separation from the commons um, and, and, and where we see the, the impacts of having, but, but suffering from the creation of the commons, meaning energy. Similarly, we see where we, I think someone already commented on how we're being divested of our land and our housing, whether it's through disaster or through even some of these situations we talk about, like East Chicago-led situation, where now 1,100 families have been moved away because of the intensity of that Superfund site there. Or we have communities like Mossville, where they just put in, in Mossville, Louisiana, where they put industry on, in, on top of industry in those communities. And now, um, when they're proposing another community, the whole the solution is to move those communities away. As Leslie talked about the pipeline in St. James Parish in Louisiana where that's on top of all the other industries that have already been there and now the solution is buying, pe buying people out and moving them away. Similarly with these disasters, whether it is um, communities that are, that are facing mass um, extinction really from being impacted from disasters, sea level rise that's taken over communities like Thib Thibodeau, Louisiana where they're losing a football field size of, um, worth of land every hour due to the rising of the seas and the sinking of the land because of offshore oil drilling. Then we have a place like Barbuda, a, a country of African descent, where in the first, for the first time in 300 years, no one is living on that land. So we're seeing just this, this kind of systematic displacement. In the community I talked about before, River Park in Florida, where the Haitian community lived, they're, they're also, they, they actually have a notice that they all have to move by Friday because they've declared this to be a dangerous situation because of the, the, uh, the loss of the roof and the electrical, the electrical situation I mentioned. But that community, the NAACP had reached out to me some months ago about that community because they were trying to push folks out of that community because it was it's riverfront property. And that's why it's called River Park. And it's um, right in the middle of Naples, which, as you know, has multi-million dollar condos. And so now they, they're, they're fearing that they see this opportunity now to permanently displace people after this disaster. So we really need to, as, as we were talking about, think about the solutions, whether it's land policies, housing policies, certainly utility reform policies, to make sure that we don't continue to be on the very bottom of these systemic um, challenges. So I, yes, so I just want to, <clears throat> I just want to add one thing. So I want you all to understand that we have power. Y'all say power. power. Say power. Power. Say power like you believe it. Power. So you have communities, because we need to also, so we've been talking about environmental injustices. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about environmental justice. Environmental justice is about revitalizing our communities, about bringing strength and power back into our communities. Yes. You have communities like Spartanburg, South Carolina. You have communities like the Ivanhoe neighborhood in Kansas City. Yes, Google this so that you know, so that you, when people come to you about our communities, you can talk about how change has happened. The Ivanhoe community in, in um, Kansas City. You have communities like a national city with the Environmental Health Coalition in San Diego who are making significant changes inside their community. You have faith-based examples, a, a good tie into what's next, uh, like Bethel New Life in Chicago. You also have the work of Reverend Floyd Flake in Jamaica, Queens. And you have Re uh, Reverend Buster Soares also in Northern Jersey who have been able to revitalize their community. So in one minute, I'm gonna give you one story. So in Spartanburg, South Carolina, Harold Mitchell, who runs the Regenesis Project, took a $20,000 environmental justice small grant and leveraged it into $300 million in changes inside of their community. This is a community-driven project. They had Superfund sites, they had brownfield sites, they had bad transportation routes where trains used to come and idle and people couldn't leave their community until the train moved. They had old shotgun housing. How many people from the South who are here? Y'all know what shotgun housing is. Ain't no energy efficiency. You open the front door and you can look out the back door. You had food deserts. 
Seniors had to travel half an hour to get to a supermarket. How much sense does that make? You didn't have access to health care. And now they have, so I'm just going to move forward real quickly. Now they have new transportation routes. The Brownfield and Superfund sites have been cleaned up. They have 500 new green homes where before they were paying almost three to $400 for electricity costs in the summertime, and now it's down to $67 a month. Wow. So now you have more disposable income in your pocket. Those Brownfield and Superfund sites have now been cleaned up and they're putting a 35 acre solar farm in their community. So that now zeroes out that electricity bill and the additional goes to the grid and the money comes back to the community. That's what power is about. Reverend Woodbury is over there. He's been leading uh, solar trainings as well. So that's how we build power. That's how we change the dynamic. And they also got their folks to vote. So now they have folks who are on the city council and the county commission and Harold was in the state house. That's power. So that when people were making decisions, they were helping to move resources to their community and to this new administration. That's what they are afraid of. That is why they continue to cut the programs, the CDBG dollars that were out there at HUD. Folks utilize those dollars. They utilize Tiger Grants for the transportation routes. They utilize Environmental Justice Small Grant. So heck yeah, they're going to be upset at Environmental Justice because they know it's about giving voice to the community so that they can make the change that's necessary. So when you say power, understand that you have that ability. You have the ability to get engaged. You have the ability to work in authentic partnerships with our communities to make real change happen. So we should be very, very laser focused on what needs to happen. The CBC should be utilizing these examples and saying this is how we holistically utilize our resources and our knowledge. And we're going to travel around this country. We're going to identify 20 locations where we're going to change the dynamics inside of these communities so that when people know that investing in our communities yields positive results, that's power. Preach, Mustafa. I needed that word because I was feeling real hopeless just a second ago. That's good, though. And thank you. Can you stand for a second just so we can acknowledge you for your work, Reverend? Reverend Woodbury. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Nobody wants to follow Mustafa's word. You have a, do you have a promising word? Or are you taking me no, back to I, gloom and doom? No, 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 no. No more <laughs> doom and gloom. No. I we need to be enough. real, though. We no, got to tell people what's going on. But I, I'm not the moderator, Angela. You are. But I want to pose a question. Is that okay? You already asked me okay. one just now. Okay. Ask your second question. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. So, <laughs> Mustafa talked about power and empowering communities, and he talked about voting, and, and you mentioned leadership earlier, Angela, and so I want to first acknowledge uh, the leadership uh, from Texas Southern University, the SGA. You guys stand just for a moment. Can we give them a hand? All right, SGA. Here. It's my alma mater. I want to give them a shout out. <laughs> um, he doing but, shout outs and questions and... I but still I, ain't heard the question. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a hard time. So, so Come on, Lita. How do, how do we craft our messaging so we can empower communities, so we can reach young people uh, like those folk and other folks in this room to uh, step forward and run for office on a platform around environmental justice and climate? Do we have the right messaging? Are we reaching our young people the right way? Are we talking about polar bears when we're talk talking about environmental issues? Or should we talk about Eric Garner and Corn Gaines and, and those other cases that can connect? That's just a question I, I wanted to pose. I know. You, you better ask your question and answer it. <laughs> Here I mean, yeah. um, So is, I don't know. Is this question to the panel? Sure. Sure. I, I want to make sure I understand. Tell. You know I ain't going to miss opportunity to tell somebody something. Stop is going to give you your message. So there are a couple of initiatives that the Hip Hop Caucus has. One of them is the Respect My Vote campaign. So we utilize artists and entertainers um, for them to be able to share that message um, to get people engaged. So when you have folks like Common or when you have folks like Wiz Khalifa or you know uh, Kendrick Lamar or so many of the other folks who are out there, they have influence because people trust them. They also honor that talent and skill that they have. The other part is people's climate music. So we begin to infuse culture uh, into this so that it has meaning, so that it resonates with folks because they see folks who come from where they come from and it helps to make change. So those are just two of the ways. But I think that if we don't get engaged in the voting process, as Damien said, also identifying candidates who are going to be authentic uh, and who are going to represent us and when the hard times come, are not going to fold, but we have a responsibility also. 
in that space. We have to surround those folks wow. so that when they stand up, that they are, they have, you know, our backing. Um, and we got to stay engaged for a four year process. We got to be there on local elections, county elections, in the midterms, uh, and in the general elections. I never tell people to vote for who to vote for, but that you have a responsibility to get engaged in the process. Okay, Mustafa, don't put, pull that mic back yet. Here's a question. Yes, ma'am. When are you running? No, ma'am. <laughs> Tell him you want him to run, y'all. Come on. I love my people, and I'm happy and working on environmental justice issues for the last 25 years. You can do it in Congress. Then you need to do it in Congress. Yeah, great folks. Mr. McEachin needs help. Mr. Conyers needs help, right? You all, this, listen, Mr. Con, if Mr. Conyers says you got to do it, then you really got to do it. Well, oh, you can't tell the dean no. You can tell me no. You can't tell. Congressman anyway. Conyers told me a long time ago, if you want to know something's a priority, look at the budgets. And when he told me that one evening, he probably don't even remember he told me that when I worked for him almost 10 years ago. If you want to know if people truly care about our issues, look at the budgets. And if they don't care about our issues, find somebody who does. He said that's right, and he said, he said that's right when I said run, but anyway, so I'm going to ask the panel one last question. We're going to open up to you all. I don't know if there is a microphone that will float, because I don't see it. There is. Um, and so if you can get your questions ready. Um, I am a tough moderator. What does that mean in this context? It means I expect for you to ask a question. Um, oftentimes... When we come to the CBC Foundation's annual legislative conference, I think it might be because we're around our people, we get the preacher's anointing and we want to share and testify and all of these wonderful things. And while we know that you are brilliant and you probably could have also been on this panel, I will ask that you ask a question and I will ask the person who is floating with the microphone. That looks like it's Keenan. No, that's not Keenan. I'm sorry. Jedi is going to have it. Jedi is nice. And she's going to hold the microphone, but I will ask her to remove it if it doesn't look like you're going to get to your question anytime soon so we can get as many as possible. Now we will carry on. I said that with a smile. Okay. So I, I really um, am serious about this action-oriented plan. We could have spent another hour on this because I didn't ask you all any of these proposed questions. But one of the things that I really want to ask you all is just from what motivates you on these issues, right? Like, if you had to choose one thing walking out of the door that these folks need to immediately begin working on because it is your life's work, it is one of the things that, you know, keeps you up at night, it's the reason why, you know, you wake up in the morning um, related to environmental justice or the injustice side, the climate change piece, whatever it is, what is the one thing you would tell these folks to walk out? And you all don't all have to agree, I just want you all to share your one. And we can go down. Daryl, we can start with you. I've seen you nodding a lot, but I have not heard from you in a little while. So let's start oh, with you. Well, I mean, this is my personal issue. I've been crawling through the schools for 28 years looking at environmental hazards. So I'm going to be, you know, a little selfish here. I was just in Detroit last year, and uh, Representative Conyers helped us fight the state that has neglected Detroit schools for years. And... Um, the conditions those kids live uh, and try to learn in are, are deplorable, and they still are. Um, I want to applaud Representative Bobby Scott for introducing the Re Rebuilding America Schools. Uh, they'll try to at least leverage some of this so-called infrastructure money that's coming down the pipe. But to all of you uh, who are, believe in environmental justice, I hope you rep, uh, work with Representative Scott and, and the caucus on making sure that uh, these kids have the guarantee of having a school sited in the right place, making sure that their conditions put in so these schools are healthy, they're energy efficient, and, and uh, green. So every child deserves a legal entitlement to a safe and healthy school, which in this country they do not have. So work on that too. That every child in the state, district, state, and federal level has the entitlement to a safe and healthy school. Isn't that interesting that they don't have the right to that? Hello, hello. Mustafa, before you chime in here, this um, bill, Rebuild America Schools, um, to my two members who are here, because we can immediately address this. Are you all co-sponsors of this bill? Do you know? 
If you can check staff, where are the, where are the great, wonderful staffers that make these things happen? Do we know? Yes? Never mind. There's no action item there because he's working woke. Mr. McEachin is working woke. Mr. Conyers, we're going to find out from you. Do we know Mr. Conyers? Yes. Yes. We'll find out, Mr. Conyers. He has to introduce yes. a lot of bills, y'all. There's a lot to fix. So we're going to find out. He said yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Conyers is too. Thank you, Mr. Conyers and Mr. McEachin. That was an action item that's already checked off. We don't have to do that work. Mustafa. Um, get engaged in the civic process and then translate that into revitalizing our most vulnerable communities. It's the only way that it's going to happen. I, one thing that I want you to take away is that, you know, despite all that we have been subjected to, we have been resilient. Right? We have survived, we have thrived, right? And so um, we have that power that within us. And so what we need to do is to one, be self-reliant, that's the first thing. So you say evacuate, evacuate, <laughs> okay? Let's be self-reliant, let's be community resilient, right? So um, whether that you wanna act locally in your community, you wanna to donate to Puerto Rico, you wanna to travel to Florida and, and spend some time there, do that as well and then also be politically active, as we've talked about. Individually voting, organize your, your community around the issues, and whether you help create, shape, uh, and, 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 and enact policy, that's one way to go to. I think it's a great question. Um, one of the, the reason I really love EJ so much is that anybody can be involved. Anybody can do it. You can be a student, you can be a teacher, you can be um, any professional, any profession, you can be a day laborer, you can be a child care worker, you can be involved in environmental justice because it's where you work, live, play, and worship. It's your community, it's right there, it's your house. And so there really isn't any great formula, it's just that if your school across the street, and I started my career doing school siding cases, I don't have kids, I care about all the kids, so Daryl, what Daryl's saying is really, resonate, really resonates with me, and I've seen schools next to lead smelters and refineries and polyvinyl chloride plants, and I mean, it's just unbelievable to put a school. We did a campaign last year in New Orleans. They were going to put a school in yet another dump, and we had a kid wearing a hazmat suit, and the, the ad said, this is your child's school uniform if this school is going to be put on this dump. All right, that resonated with people. All right, so the, yes, but I think also the, one of the other things that resonates that gets people involved is that there's a lot of indigenous knowledge in every community. The problem with this work, one side effect, is that it has become professionalized. Yes. You have folks in the community, the elders, folks who've been there, you know, who really know what happened. They know when that place was, they know how, they know what it was like to, to fish in the creek when the creek was clean. And they could tell you about the kinds of fish, and they could tell you about what it felt like. They could tell you how the summer was 40 years ago, and how now the summer, it's 100 degrees now for six weeks, right? So don't, that, that is part about building the power, because everybody can get involved. And do not dismiss anybody just because they don't have a lot of capital letters behind their name. Right, mm -hmm. or yeah. because yeah. they lived down over there, or <laughs> so over there, there. Or didn't go to that school. Um, we, are, we, we need everybody's, we need everybody's um, experience, and we need everybody's brain. We've got really hard problems, but there's a lot of solutions. There's a lot of opportunity um, in this sector. It's a very good sector for students. You can get involved in so many ways in the energy environmental sector, and um, we're all happy to talk to you about that. But. Don't leave anybody behind and get in, but you can do any time, you can get involved in terms of full-time or part-time or just on the weekends. And so that's why it's taken me all over the world. It's been a blessing, it's a calling. And um, even if it's something you're doing just as a cleanup, community cleanup, that is a huge thing to do in your community. Because that just shows your love and, and we really have to really love, we have to love our world because we are really, having some dire problems with their solutions to. Um, quickly, um, why do I love the work? It's about our children. Um, before I move now, to Now, me, you know you answering your own question because that's not what I asked, right? <laughs> He's over here texting or something because that was not my question. What was the question? I'm so sorry. The question was... <laughs> 
If you had one thing, oh, it's going to be in this. It's going to be. But, but where is what the why okay, I love okay, the work okay. is? Come on, leader. So answer the one, your the own one, question. The one Come thing. On. The one thing. I'm so sorry, Angela. I was teasing her. The one thing. Um, well, let me just say this really quick. <laughs> before I moved, before I moved to DC, I did some work in Houston around criminal justice work, mm -hmm. right? Um, body cameras and so forth and so on. And that's important work. And we have people marching in the streets. People get really excited about that work, mm -hmm. right? But then I also realized that asthma is killing more of our children mm -hmm. than uh, uh, a police's bullet, right? And so when I realized that, I said, no, this, this work is very important too. And that's why I asked the question, how do we get more people engaged in the streets around EJ? So for me, it's about investing in our young people in every way that we can. You know, that's why I'm so happy to see uh, brothers and sisters in here, uh, young folk, but invest in our young people every way we can because this resistance that we need to have, this revolution, this movement that needs to happen in this country, especially what's going on with the administration, it's going to be led by young people, right? And so, I mean, we have great experts here, but if we continue to invest in college-age students, our young people save their lives so they can lead this country and we can achieve the level of democracy that we need to see in this country. So it's about our young people. You still want to tell us why you love the work or you folded that in? No, 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 no. no. You were good. It was good. Okay. Y'all, you got a CBC family. This is what we do. We give them a hard time. We're teasing. I love you, Angela. <laughs> Jane talks about you all the time. I love you back. Come on. Tell me. Okay, one thing the audience should take away. So um, I was going to answer Damien's question, Angela, but I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, go for it. Y'all going rogue up here. Y'all are the real activist leadership. You're going to do your thing. So it's fine. Y'all can be rebellious. It's I'll, for a good cause. <laughs> um, I'll be both. You know, I, I think the one thing everyone should take away is, is a few things. We've talked a lot very transparently on this panel about how big this challenge is. Uh, we need to walk away and tell the story about how hard it is, but that has to be followed by the story of standing up to that challenge and setting goals that are absolutely hard to achieve for yourselves, for your family, and for others so that you can move forward. And so I think that's the big takeaway, and, and I'll give an example of that. Um, you, know, you know, my company, General Motors, set some pretty big goals in 2010 goals that said that we were going to improve energy efficiency, imp decrease the amount of water we're using, improve the quality of the communities we live in, go landfill free in 150 facilities. And at the time that those goals were set, I was in one of those facilities and, and the company started talking about landfill free and I was leading the engineering team and I was like, this is crazy. But what I quickly realized is that it was crazy, but that we could do it. Because when we rallied people around a goal that they could get their heads around, and we were focused on teaching them, staying with them long enough, and bringing them with us to teach them how we could do it, then everyone started getting excited about what they were able to do. And while we really had no clue how we were going to do what we said we were going to do, as we started teaching people, they started coming up with their own ideas. And so, you know, we... we kind of just went with that momentum and they started sharing ideas with other facilities and they started you know, rallying around this idea of we're decreasing the carbon footprint, we're decreasing our company's carbon footprint and it's not just vehicle emissions. We're doing that too. But what was really cool to watch was all the people that realized how powerful they were. And we did that within the company and we said that by 2020 we would have 150 facilities landfill free. It's 2017, we have 152 landfill free right now and we're still going. And people are coming up with more and more ideas every day. And we're setting new goals to be 100% renewable by 2050. I'll tell you, that's in my core responsibility. I have no idea how I'm going to do it, but we will get it done through the creativity of the people, by pushing the people. So the takeaway is, you know, set big goals, right? Know that it's big and know that it's hard, but try. Because in the try, it, it just, it opens up creativity and empowerment like you wouldn't believe, like you can't even imagine right now. Um, Tola, thank you. I have a, a question for you. If you, um, if you would consider this, you mentioned earlier about uh, working with Habitat for Humanity. And I think whether we're talking about Leslie's story earlier or Mustafa's story earlier, 
we have organizations who are on the ground doing this work for our folks and just would encourage you all to consider funding some of this work with folks that are funded by, worked on by, um, and operate in communities of color for people of color. Um, especially if, we, if everyone, including you've acknowledged on the panel that these communities are the hardest hit. Obviously, we need to build homes, so we're not trying to take funds from Habitat for Humanity, but also just want to acknowledge with GM's budget and the work that we all know, all we can, we spend time talking about how we are stretched so thin, we don't have the staffing, we don't have the infrastructure, you know, in our community org. So that would be, there may be some great opportunities for partnership up here on this panel. That was not a question. That was a recommendation. Was, was I'm sorry. I'm following Damien's lead. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you for that. Yes, ma'am, Miss Jacqueline. Thank you very much. So as long as we have situations where Halliburton can actually apply for an exemption from, from the safe drinking water yes. to, yes. to do hydraulic fracturing, yeah, <laughs> and when we have situations like the, the Flint, Michigan situation mm -hmm. arose from you know the, top, the, the very fact that the, the river was allowed to be so toxic in the first place yeah. is because we're, we have people who are holding sway over our policies that mean we don't have the proper regulations for clean air or clean water. And as long as we have people making decisions like the Army Corps of Engineers, which uses a formula to decide which levees they're going to fortify based on applying points to each levee to say which one would have um, the greatest impact if it was overtaken by, by storm surge. So we, we, I would say to all of you that we really need to unite around campaign finance reform and getting money out of politics. Getting money out of politics. Uh, let's take this. This becomes a, a much easier task right now. What I w propose, and first of all, I wanted to recognize that the sheriff of Wayne County, Michigan, the largest county in the state, is Benny Napoleon, and he is here with us today. Stand up, Benny. Give him a round of applause. Because I'm, I'm going to get with him, Telva Magruder, uh, and my chief of staff, attorney Ray Plowden, uh, and begin to work on how we disseminate uh, all of the things. Oh, and uh, also attorney Dan Helvig is here, too. Uh, on my staff. And what, what we want to do is how do we get this out to the millions of people of the Congressional Black Caucus uh, and uh, the uh, House and the Senate, uh, all of the elected officials uh, that are progressive. Uh, th this could be Huge, and of course, I've been to Flint so many times, and and uh, I'm I'm totally amazed at the resilience and determination of these people a after all they've gone through, and all the mistakes that have been made uh, by uh, those that that could have done so much more about it, and so. Uh, my whole thing is to promote what we've spent a few, a couple hours on and get it out to get more people to do this and identify uh, the way at, at all levels. Uh, ultimately, uh, the White House and the federal legislature, but this is a huge subject that we've dealt with today and I just wanted to commend uh, you Angela for all the good work you've done but just think of what we can do uh, we've got some great communication people here uh, yeah, in the, the Congressional Black Caucus and uh, that's what we're going to do is promote what, what we've talked about boil it down and get it out. Okay. Thank you thank so you, much. Mr. Okay, thank you.
And before we close, we do want to make sure we give you all an opportunity to ask questions. Are there any questions in the audience? We have a first question here. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Jason Turner, and I live in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm a member of the uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, Commission on Climate Change and Resiliency. Um, I wanted to ask one of the people a, a question, but just a quick statement here. Mayor Bloomberg and billionaire uh, founder uh, Michael Bloomberg um, has really uh, focused a lot of his attention on an organization called the C40, which is an organization of all, like the 40 biggest cities in the world, given the fact that 70% of the population in the world is going to live in the 40 biggest cities. So my question is, uh, they've gotten a lot of traction with all the mayors, and I thought it was brilliant because it really, if you've got the mayors of the biggest cities in the world, then really the Trumps or whoever it, you know, is there kind of becomes irrelevant. So I'm, I'm wondering, how can uh, we adjust or adopt a, a measure of that strategy? What is, is there a strategy in place to really focus on the mayors uh, where, we can, uh, where we can move these things? And then further, having been to conferences at the C40, and those of us who are in this field know that the green space is green, but it's the whitest thing I've, I've ever been a part of. You know, what is there a strategy for us to get involved with the C40, with the cities that have the money, with the billionaires, where we can infuse our agenda into that program? Thank you. Takers, Leslie. I think there's definitely the um, U.S. Conference of Mayors, um, the and Reverend Woodbury knows this gentleman really well. The mayor of um, Columbia, South Carolina, is the head of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, mm -hmm. and they had their conference in Miami. And I know that there was a lot on this at that time. So you know that's one target, and it's a good place. And that gentleman, who's African American, is the head of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Steve and then, Benjamin, I believe. Yeah, thank you. And then, of course, we should go, you know, I think it's a great idea. Just like, like we have a Congressional Black Caucus, you've got the, you know, the, the Association of Black Mayors, and you have the Association of County Executives, Black County Executives, and the National Association of Black State Legislatures. So, you know, it's just about organizing, um, you know, to work with these folks. And, um, but the mayor's conference, I know they did start doing that there. And, and the other side of the mm -hmm. question that you, or the statement that you made about the green movement um, not having a lot of hue, um, <laughs> look at the Green 2.0 report. Many of us yeah. who are up here are a part of that. Um, and that specifically speaks to that uh, with strategies and plans for diversifying those organizations. And those organizations have a responsibility. If we are going to win on climate, then that means that we must diversify this movement, right. that you have to honor the voices and the experience that exists from communities of color, because we've been on the ground uh, doing it for decades now. Um, so I always share that message also with all those <laughs> great folks who are in the room who are representing the big green organizations, whatever that means. That means they have more money than our organizations do, which brings me to my former point. Next question. Hi, I have a comment, a couple of comments, not a question. First of all, I'm Barbara That's, George Johnson. I'm, I'm sorry. I, please ask a question because I made this okay. whole like filibuster long statement about okay. why I really I, I need a question. I missed the filibuster statement. Okay, so. so let me tell you what it was. Okay. <laughs> it was that I need you to ask a question because we've had a full panel okay. and I want to give the opportunity for these panelists to address the concerns and questions in the audience because this is going to be an action-oriented forum. And while everyone is talented and brilliant and could have sat up here, we, do not, we already have a panel, so I really need you to ask a question. Okay, so let Thank me you. ask the question Thank then. You. How do we become less siloed? Because you have individuals up there who all have skill sets who need to be interconnected on the ground. So how do we become, become less siloed? Thank you. Mm -hmm, it is. Takers. Come on, leader. Damien, what you got? Tell them. Go ahead. You know, that idea of siloed is something we struggle with a lot. We have to, we have to be committed to understand what, what our strengths are and to understand what we're not so strong at and reach out in partnership to do things. And, and I know from, um, from my perspective, from the co corporate perspective, we do that. And as large of a company as we are, we partner with others to try to get things done. Um, so we have to be willing to teach and to learn. And then just, just so that the audience is clear, and I don't know this either, do you all feel like you regularly have the opportunities to work together up here? 
So then the issue is just a silo that exists between your organizations and what's happening on the ground. Even though Leslie just came back from Houston. Are there other ways that you all, effective strategies that have worked to remove the barrier that exists with national level organizations or folks that have national presence in communities? That's a huge question. Um, <laughs> it's a good one. There's a lot, so we could spend all day on this. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of networks, there's lots of forums. Um, Marlene, you know, runs the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance. Jackie has got NAACP tentacles everywhere. And we work with them very closely. Um, there's the EJ, there's the um, Climate Justice Alliance. There's the EJ Forum for Climate Justice, which Dr. Um, Adrian Hollis is the head of through WE Act. She's right there. And many groups are in that. And then there's the HBCU Climate Justice Consortium. There's, and that's run by Dr. Beverly Wright um, of Dillard University and Dr. Bob Buller of Texas Southern University. There is a lot of, there's a lot of networks. Mm -hmm. And um, there's the series um, coalition, coalition for environmentally responsible economies. So you have corporations, you have environmental groups, you have some um, trade associations. So it's just really what sec, you know, what issue, what form, you know, what region, there's the association, and there's the association of Blacks and Energy. I mean, that is a great network. Mm -hmm. Um, and they've got a lot of um, renewable energy professionals in it now. And so there's educators, there's environmental educators. I mean, just, you know, there's digital responsibility, the health, public health. The APHA is going to have their conference coming up, the American Public Health Association in Atlanta. And there's a whole environmental health track. It's huge. It's probably the biggest part now. Hmm. So, you know, knock yourself out. <laughs> <laughs> we have our next. Okay. Hi, you all are amazing. I just wanted to start with that. Um, my name is Fatima Mann. I'm a third year law student at Southern University Law Center in Baton Rouge. And I'm also uh, oh, co-founder of Counterbalance ATX, which is an organization in Austin that's been doing disaster relief work um, on the ground, actually. We were featured on KUT and NPR last Monday. So my question is, how do we utilize litigation to uh, change policy in regards to how the Red Cross and other governmental agencies mm -hmm. in, like, are involved in the community? So understanding that litigation can, can can birth uh, policy change and or policy implications from various departments. How do we use litigation like suing the Red Cross or <laughs> FEMA um, to uh, implement policy that will provide them with a little bit more structure and guidance when natural disasters happen? Because they don't have any right now, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lord, suing the Red Cross and FEMA. Litigation to change policy. And you do all that you just said, right? So, um, in fact, that's how I got my job at the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance. As a result of a lawsuit, funds came in, and then now we're able to um, implement some programs that we, that we thought were a problem in our communities. And so you, you have to do just that. Um, you know, I was thinking earlier about how there are times when we beat up on EPA, right? Um, the environmental justice groups... Um, don't think they're doing enough. On the other side, industries thinks they're doing too much, right? Mm -hmm. so, and so they're caught in this, in this place. Um, and, and so I think they're, sometimes government is a good ally for you. Could I, could I just add one thing? So you raised about the American Red Cross. Um, so I, I look at a different paradigm. So why don't we begin, when we decide to donate, why don't we donate to our own organization? So that's how you change the paradigm. When we had the hurricane that came through Houston and Port Arthur and Beaumont, uh, folks on the ground, frontline communities, began to coalesce and, and to have a just Harvey recovery. So you could go there and, and you could directly um, donate to frontline communities. So we don't have to just rely on the Red Cross um, or to those other organizations that have been around. We have to be focused on institution building. Yes. And that means that we have to build the capacity inside of our own organizations who are there, who are going to be there when the cameras leave and who are going to do the hard work. So I share that also as, uh, as something for consideration. Thank you. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brandon Galloway. And I'm a student, an undergrad at South Carolina State University and the president of our Environmental Action Club. And so uh, earlier, I think she mentioned that there is not enough professionals 
and uh, infrastructure within these communities um, who are facing environmental injustice issues. And, and the reason being is because there is not enough curriculum to provide degrees towards sustainable development. And so that is the reason why we are asleep, why we are slow in sleep, because we don't have these uh, professionals and infrastructure. So how can CBC, or my question is, how can CBC direct funds and political leverage towards higher education to promote literacy and curriculum, uh, investing into solutions within communities of environmental injustice issues, for example, HBCUs? Hmm. I just want to kind of correct um, your statement because what I was trying to say was that we have people in communities have indigenous knowledge, which is very important knowledge too. And don't just look at people with capital letters behind their names. But yes, of course we want to invest in our young people and, and to have careers. And so um, there's, I've, you know, we mentioned there's the HPCU Climate Justice Alliance which is very strong now, and um, I think that the CBC should you know, partner with them in some form or fashion. And um, they had the HBCU conference earlier, and so there's already you know, a lot of, I think, a lot of coalition building, and we can get you those contacts. Thank you. Um, for the CBC-related portion, I just want to remind the audience that it's important to note that uh, the CBC members, many of which are Democrat, there's only one CBC member who's a Republican, are not in the majority. And so what that means for legislating, which I think was the heart of your question, is it becomes very difficult when uh, parties are so divided. And I think you've seen the increasing, or the growing divides, they grow on the daily. So members continue to push out legislation and continue to represent what's in the best interest of HBCUs, but at some point that legislation has to get passed. Great reminder to stay civically engaged and go vote and tell your friends to do the same. Next question. Oh, absolutely. Sorry. I just wanted to add um, that uh, the, sorry, yes. we, that Laureen and I are going straight from here to the National Technical Association Conference, which a lot of people don't know about the National Technical Association, but it's a con it's an association of basically um, um, black folks who are in the tech in you know technical fields of work. And so we are actually going to be ambassadors from this panel to have this conversation. And the thing that I've been doing, all the, I've been 100% paying attention, but also putting together my presentation for that, uh, for that, uh, for that uh, event. And it, it, it really is all about all, how all of those folks can contribute to, to, this, um, to the field of environmental and climate justice, and then also how they can to help to build the next generation as teachers and, as, and, and college instructors and so forth. And the other thing I'll add is the NAACP has a, a document called Teaching Environmental Justice in the Classroom that curates all the environmental and climate justice curricula we were able to find across the country. And then we're also now working with NASA and with the University of Washington to put together some explicit curriculum for at least the, the, the um, elementary and high school um, classroom. So I just want to put that. Thank you. Hi, you mentioned the 23 cities with, oh. with, with worse uh, or as bad levels of uh, water in New Jersey and also Superfund sites. Could you give us resources to where the public could access the environment conditions within their area or their family? There are some, there are, we can get you the uh, citing for the exact report, but there are a number of like, nonprofit organizations who, re who produce reports like that, but a lot of the data that you use come from state departments of environmental protection mm -hmm. or from the Environmental Protection Agency. Those are some of the sources. If you want a tool, I'm no, just going to say, um, see my organization, the Sierra Club, we just put out a Harvey <coughs> Toxic Sites map, um, which is, um, has all the toxic sites in the region, the Coastal Bend region, um, and you can find it on um, sierraclub.org backslash environmental justice. And you can go to uh, the Office of Environmental Justice at EPA. They have a tool called EJ Screen. Right. You can literally put in your zip or your lot, uh, lat longs, those different types of things. You can click on a couple of different boxes, and it will illuminate for you, give you a screenshot of the things that are going on inside of your community. Uh, air pollution, uh, there's a little bit of water in there, demographic data, health data, those different types of things. You will be surprised some of the things that are right in your neighborhood that you might not have known that's there. Now that's up right now. <clears throat> we gotta hope it stays up. 
I know, maybe that. Yeah. Sorry, it's true though. We're okay. You are moving. I'm like, we can't find you. Um, hello, thank you very much um, for your comments. My name is Penelope Bunn. I'm senior editor of Society and Diplomatic Review in New York. Um, we basically uh, write about uh, the sustainable developmental goals. Um, my magazine is called Society and Diplomatic Review. It's distributed to 193 countries around the world. And our main thrust is promoting uh, awareness about the SDGs, which by 2030, if we don't do something, you know, our planet is in uh, serious trouble. And it's going to affect us the most because uh, of, you know, that we are the most uh, vulnerable. Let's put it like that. I'm glad that I'm in a position to promote anybody that's doing anything about the SDGs. Uh, we want to write about it. And my question is, my question is, what is everybody doing to um, encourage the media to write about it as well as not just black media, but other media um, so that our voices can be heard? Because as the gentleman said, it is very white in the environmental room. So thank you. Anybody want to respond? No? Okay. Well, no, yes. it's, just, okay. It's, it's difficult to get um, stories about our, our issues in the mainstream media. And um, first off, because the media has shrunk. And there used to be the reporters that did the environmental beat. There's fewer of those who have, they're more general reporters. And so there's a few good ones. I, you know, in The Guardian, um, particularly, and then you have Poplubica, um, um, our good friend Talia Buford um, is there, and you have Think Progress and those, and then the great Brenton Mock, who works, who writes for City Lab and other publications, um, has talked about this as well. So there are a few, but it's it, it's it's hard um, to get through all of that, to get through yeah, get through talking about the icebergs and the polar bears, which are important, and the gray wolves. You know, but we, it's, it's, it's part of that struggle. Well, let me just say that, you know, this goes back to the political will. Mm -hmm. And when you can make noise and organize people locally around issues, you will get publicity. Mm -hmm. And that's a, the first and foremost place we should start with media. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, then, you know, social media, which you young people use all the time, and in mm -hmm. fact, black folks use Twitter more than anybody else, should be using that as a vehicle for getting these stories out. And you have to make your voice heard. Yeah. You have to reach out to these uh, media organizations and, and, and let them know what you're looking for. Um, and if enough people do that, it'll get their attention. They want to have viewership. Um, so if you let them know the things that you care about, and the individuals who are on those shows speaking truth to power, you have to make sure that you're also supporting them as well. So just to tag on to what Mustafa said, I think it is really important that people pay attention to what is in the media and act on it accordingly and, and share what they think about the impact that's being stated in the media. Um, you know, we personally try to get as much information out in the media about what we're doing. You know, we're going to re reduce crashes, you know, zero emissions, reduce congestion in urban communities because that's where they need the help and that decreases um, emissions as well with electric vehicles. But what we're interested in and we're out on Twitter and we're doing all kinds of things to say this is what we're doing, this is what we think is important. We're interested in people coming back and echoing that back so we can make sure we're doing the right things or giving us new things to think about. And so that's one suggestion I would lay out there as well. The other thing I would say on that is that um, so with, with the NAACP, we decided to hire a full-time communications manager around environmental and climate justice. And we want to think about, and one thing with, with the, the organization that is easy for us to get in the, in the media because of our name, and particularly because speaking out on environmental issues seems unusual for the media. So they get excited and they want to, they want to cover it. But at the same time, we really want the, the, the frontline community voices to be, to be um, featured prominently. And a lot of times, they really want that kind of um, sound bite or whatever. 
And so I would really be a proponent of, of creating our own media and then making it go viral enough so that it then compels the, the, the mainstream media to get involved because otherwise they'll truncate our story down to, I mean, you know the, the uh, African proverb, until the lion writes his own story, the tale of the hunt will always go to the hunter. And so, um, and so we really need to be telling our own stories in the way that we need to yeah. tell it and other people need to follow us in that. And so, we re so the reason we hired full-time communications managers is we can figure out how to strategically do that, like really get our story the way we want to tell it, our communities, into the media as opposed to just kind of, because a lot of times they will, like, chase after the NAACP if we're doing like a march or if we're doing something kind of fantastic or, it's, or something that's um, and fantastic in a negative sense of the word in terms of just kind of something that kind of grabs the headlines but not necessarily really wanting to cover the depth and the substance. And so I would, I would say creating our own story as well as building relationships with folks who, who, are, who have deep integrity in the media who can then do a deeper dive in terms of coverage. So folks at The Nation and, and other um, um, outlets that are, and even The Atlantic have been able to, we've been able to cultivate relationships and so they can do a deeper story as opposed to those kind of sound bites. So, oh, thank you. One thing I'll say quickly at the Union of Concerned Scientists, we, we uh, we're blessed to hire Shanti Washington. Shanti, raise your hand really quick. She's one of our co communications officers, um, young, brilliant scholar. And so she's done a great job of help, helping us reach out to uh, more diverse media outlets to get these real stories about disparities and inequities in our community. But also, I think it's also about environmental justice issues aren't, it isn't sexy enough for folk to really click and share and so forth. I mean, Angela, I know you, when you share certain things with your podcast and your outlets, you get a lot of lot, lot of likes. If you share something about environmental justice, it may not be uh, as sexy. Uh, to I have folks. to be accountable in saying I don't really share that much. Like Flynn is one thing, and I think that we have to be honest in saying it's an anomaly, right? right? And it's because it got coverage. So it's a da it's this dangerous, very cyclical effect. If we're not sharing the stories, it's not going to get covered. If it doesn't get covered, we don't share. So one of us has to decide to break the cycle. I'm going to be accountable today in saying. I've been educated. I'm going to definitely do my part in ensuring it makes it to the podcast and makes it on air. Absolutely. So I appreciate your, your, your uh, question. Thank you. You got to make it more sexy somehow. Uh, well, thank you, Damien. Uh, and thank you all for that question and answer because, again, uh, I'm Shanti Washington. I do media relations and communications for an organization like this. So I'm just I'm glad to hear your responses and I'll keep an eye out for your podcast, Angela. Um, my question for, for you all is, you've kind of put some, some confidence in the younger folk, or millennials as you all have been calling us, and to carry on this um, movement. And I think that there's some traction going on, but there seems to be a divide in our movement and our caring and having our political representative, representatives be on board and also champion these causes. Um, so how can we close that gap, hopefully in 2018, but definitely by 2020, so we can have our candidates answering questions about environmental issues and environmental justice issues, and making sure that they're not just signing on, but definitely in the forefront with this as part of their causes. Anna? Anybody? You could run your own candidates. You could yeah. run for office yourself. Yeah, there you go. And then there's our... Good friend, uh, our friends Stephanie and Quentin James, who Yay. have Collective Pack, who yes. are running and raising money for African American candidates and many and mostly young people. So they have started that organization. I, I recommend looking at that. Um, and um, yeah. well, one thing I'll, I'll say, and thank you for your question, Ashanti. Um, as young folk, we got to be fearless, and we we've I mean we. Folk tell us to wait our turn, right, and be respectful and mindful. But uh, Mr. Conyers, I mean, I, you, you've been uh, the dean for a long time. You've been in the house for a long time. And, and I know when you ran, I'm sure you didn't wait your turn. You were just fearless about it. And you said, I want to save my community. And so I'm going to step out and do it. And I think as young people, we ju just got to step out and put our name in the hat and say, this is what we're going to do. We want to stand tall for our community. We may lose the election. That's OK. But Martin said you do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, right? And so if that comes with a political loss, so what? But you can lay your head down at night saying, I stood up for my community. So, I mean, one way to close that gap is just be fearless and just step out there um, and run for office. We need more candidates of color, and we need more young candidates who are ready uh, to lead this country. Emphasis on more, because one of my pet peeves is hearing um, a lot of our folks talk about 
our members have been in office too long, right? CBC members. And let me use Mr. Mr. Kynes as an example. He's the ranking member on judiciary because he stayed in office. So we don't get to leadership if our members don't stay in office. So I would also encourage you to not target CBC members, unless you don't think they're doing the work, but figure out a way to grow the caucus. Emphasis on more. We need more. We, there's not enough. They represent less than 10% of the Congress. We need more of us, not less of us. So let's not take each other out. Black on black violence on any level is bad. <laughs> we good? Let's do one more question and we'll wrap up. Hi, my name is Emily Kearns and I'm with the National Audubon Society. I'm part of the blackness of the environmental movement. Absolutely. Uh, I wanted to talk about the protection of uh, watersheds, uh, wetlands, and how we aren't talking about protecting our natural areas and those natural areas belong to all of us and how that is just as much an environmental justice issue as making sure the water is clean in Flint and other places and how we can make organizations like National Audubon Society and the National Sierra Club connect to, to everybody. Well, I'll start with, there's an organization called Bringing Equity into Alignment. Is it for impact? The, the B initiative. And so there are mainstream environmental groups, for lack of better words, and environmental justice groups who are coming together to talk about, right, and funders to talk about just what you, just those issues. How do we work together um, so that there are, there's, there's more equity um, in the environmental movement? I'll just say, I think it's somewhere, between, I'll say it on average, 3% of the funding that goes to environmental groups goes to environmental justice groups. So there's 97% who are talking about polar bears and, and what have you, and 3% who are talking about the people. And so there, there's, there's an opportunity for us to connect a little better. I, you're right to bring up the natural systems and um, the, the reason why our, our communities are being so destroyed by the storms is because the natural systems have been destroyed, the bayous, the wetlands, and um, we've been restoring Bayou Benvenu and Bayou Sauvage in New Orleans East and, um, and also Bayou Benvenu in uh, the Lower Ninth Ward because the, you need multi-level lines of defense. You just can't have a levee. And if you've lost your Bayou, that's why these pipelines are so terrible. Louisiana is sinking, as you all know. We're losing a football field of land a day, an hour, because the pipelines, they're all just charging through and destroying the wetlands. So when you have storm surge, they've always had, you don't have that sponge and you have the storm surge which destroys everything. And so I grew up fishing with my grandparents. We still fish. Who doesn't fish? I mean, every culture in the world fishes. We all enjoy the outdoors and there's, it, is a, it is a civil rights issue. There's a lot of groups working on um, making sure that um, people of color enjoy the outdoors and also protecting the, the natural systems. And there's many groups doing that. And, you know, people of color groups. Outdoor, Outdoor Afro, Afro oh, you know, Facebook. yeah, um, they're great. And um, Latino Outdoors, um, mm -hmm. Green Latinos, there's um, Black Girls Bike, Black Girls Walk. I mean, it's just so many groups now. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. So we got a number of marching orders before we opened up for Q&A. Um, Daryl talked to us about her passion for schools. I would encourage you, if you're not represented by Mr. McEachin or Mr. Conyers, to ensure that your boss is co I'm your boss. See, that's where, that's where my mind, they're still my bosses. Not your boss, my old bosses. But to ensure that your member of Congress is a co-sponsor of the Rebuild America Schools Act. Um, Mustafa talked about civic engagement, and then later he chimed in during Q&A to encourage us to read the Green 2.0 report on climate diversity. Lorene talked about us being self-reliant, community resilient, politically active, um, and to also check into state departments of environmental protection to see where we can uh, see the impact of uh, different issues impacting our communities, environmental issues impacting our communities. Leslie talked about um, environmental justice was her one issue she wanted you all to go out the door dealing with because anyone can do it. It doesn't matter about the letters behind your name. I love that. And don't leave anyone behind. I appreciate that as well. Damien, you started talking about asthma, but talked about more holistically investing in our young people so that we have the resources and the tools to go out and deal with these things, these issues. Um, Telva, you talked about, tell the story of how hard it is 
but also address um, the importance of rising to the challenge. Jacqueline, clean water, you also said campaign finance reform, emphasis on campaign finance reform, and Mr. Conyers talked about utilizing staff resources on the Hill, his colleagues, um, the progressives among them, to promote and share the message on the impact of this very important issue to our community. There are more than enough marching orders for us all. Let's please be educated, aware, and go out and work woke. Thank you to our wonderful panel. Thank you to our event sponsors, Mr. Conyers and Mr. McKeachin. Thank you all for being a wonderful audience. percent of EPA's funding. Congress votes on this budget this month. The largest budget cut in environmental protection history. If these budget cuts pass, we all lose, but especially our most vulnerable, and we can't let that happen. We like to share a short video clip that we pulled together to help show why this fight against poverty and pollution is so personal, not only to our executive director, Vien Trung, but also from moms across the country who are mobilizing for clean air, clean water, and a future for our kids. So at Green for All, we're launching the Not On Our Watch petition to tell Congress to protect the Environmental Protection Agency's funding from being cut. And we're asking everyone to join us by signing on, including you in this room. Please text GREEN to 97483. I'll share that info again. Please text GREEN to 97483. Our goal is to garner 100,000 signatures. Please join us in that effort today. You may show the video. My parents came here into Oakland, California as refugees from the war in Vietnam. I grew up in a neighborhood that was the murder capital of the country. I witnessed my first murder when I was eight and it becomes normal to you. I understand that people who are living across this country are dealing with that level of anxiety and fear and nervousness and it keeps them up at night, it keeps me up at night. That's why we're bringing moms together. Every time we go to speak up from the very beginning, the moms, the women have been put down. You don't have a science degree, you don't have a PhD, just sit in the background and let us experts handle it. But in Flint, it was the experts that poisoned us, that let people die. Moms are the moral centers. They are the ones who understand what's at stake. My kids have Severs disease in their heels now because their growth plates have hardened prematurely. Our doctors are lost. They, they don't know how to handle this type of poisoning. From cities to suburbs to rural communities, it's about our kids. Now it's personal. My son Jacob has... Good morning. It's soon to be good afternoon. My name is Donald McEachin, and I have the great privilege of representing the 4th Congressional District of Virginia. Uh, this, is, uh, this panel has been a long time in coming. I am uh, excited about it and to uh, just share with you the, some of the reasons for my excitement. Um, I am an uh, American University graduate from undergrad and a University of Virginia School of Law graduate. Um, I have been in uh, elected office off and on for the better part of 20 years, and I um, am a freshman congressman. But that doesn't really begin to tell the story about uh, my excitement about this panel and sort of, its, from my perspective, it's, at least, its genesis. And that story is found while I'm out of political office. I, uh, lost an election in 2001. There was a guy named Mark Warner who ran for governor, a guy named Tim Kaine who ran for lieutenant governor, and a guy named Donald McEachin who ran for attorney general. So they got the gold medals that year. I got the silver medal, and I was out of office. And during that time I was out of office, I began a journey, an unexpected journey, through seminary at the Virginia Union University uh, Seminary called STVU, or the Samuel Direct Proctor School of Theology. It was there that I met Dr. Uh, Reverend Faith Harris and any number of other professors. And it was there that I discovered this 
notion of a religious left. And for me, it was an anchoring uh, because there was something in my spirit that had been bothering me about my previous political service. And uh, I discovered this notion of liberation theology, the notion that God comes into human history time and time and time again on the side of the oppressed. And then it occurred to me that my concerns with the Virginia General Assembly was is that they were using the word to shackle people or to engage in what I would become, would, would become known to me as empire theology and not liberation theology. They were using the word to shackle people instead of using the word to allow people to grow into the human beings that God intended them to be. And during the course of that journey, I learned about this thing called creation care and the notion that we as, uh, we as stewards of the earth uh, we were placed in the garden to be stewards of the earth. In fact, uh, the word dominion, we all, always hear people talk about the fact that uh, we were given dominion over the earth, and that is translated somehow in our, in our 21st century understanding as uh, that we can run roughshod over the earth and do what we want to do to the earth. But the reality is, is that if you do the word study, you'll see that word dominion is only, only other place that appears is in reference to the kings of Israel. And the kings of Israel were meant to be stewards of the people, and so too we were meant to be stewards of the earth. And so um, I am excited about this panel because I believe that the key to the environmental movement, the key to taking the environmental movement to the next level lies within our faith community. I believe that you all are here for a purpose, whatever your faith backgrounds might be, and I believe that if we can empower you, whether you're a preacher or a congregant, to understand these issues, we will be able to elevate the environmental movement to what I like to refer to as a kitchen table issue. Just like you're talking about how to make you pay your bills, just like how you're talking about how to get your kids to the next grade level, or how you're gonna put your kids through college, so too I would like to envision a day when when people sit around the kitchen table and talk about the environment. And I am convinced in my soul that that will only happen when we start preaching it from the pulpit. Amen. And I am convinced in my soul that the only way we can preach it from the pulpit is that our preachers and our church leaders understand the issue. And so for me, in a very real sense, this is a culmination. I'm going to try not to get teary-eyed, but this is a culmination of a long journey um, to be able to stand before you with a panel like this and to uh, suggest to, to have the... Uh, uh, audacity to suggest to you that this is uh, God's work that we're engaged in, that we're trying to empower you with God's knowledge so that you can take it back to your communities and take this, uh, take this um, movement to its next level. I am uh, awfully uh, proud to have with us as today's moderator, and I'm going to turn the floor over to her because Uh, She makes us proud each and every day we see her on CNN, (laughs) y'all. I saw her last night, and she was bossing people around last night, just like she she bosses people around on CNN. But uh, the lovely, the fabulous, the talented, and the knowledgeable Simone Sanders, y'all, has has graciously consented to be our moderator. Give her a round of applause. Well, thank you, thank you. How are y'all doing today? Uh Uh-uh, y'all can do better than that. How are y'all doing today? All right, well, I am excited and honored to be able to moderate this conversation. There's some really smart people on this panel, and uh, I think you want to hear from them. So first, I'm going to introduce the panel, because I don't think y'all have been introduced, have you? Okay, well, let's do this. So you know who I am? My name is Simone D. Sanders. I'm a CNN political commentator, and I am passionate about environmental justice, and I am happy to have this conversation today. Our panel is caring for his creation, how the faith community leads on environmental justice. And I'm sure we will unpack that environmental justice conversation shortly. All right, so first on our panel, we have Reverend Dr. Ambrose Carroll, the co-founder of Green the Church. Give a round of applause. Reverend Carroll also serves on the steering committee for Denver's Green Jobs Interfaith Coalition and is the pastor of Denver's newly formed Renewal Worship Center. Basically, uh, Reverend Carroll is busy, busy and booked. 
The Green Church is one of the first in the nation to be environmentally friendly from its inception. A round of applause for Reverend Carroll. <laughs> Next up, we have Reverend Dr. Faith Harris, everyone. Uh, Dr. Harris is a minister, a community organizer, an activist, as well as an adjunct professor for the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union University. Yes, yes. Dr. Harris is very passionate about serving the faith community, advocating for creation care, and other justice issues to improve the quality of life and faith for all. A round of applause for Reverend Dr. Faith Harris. Next, we have Reverend Dr. Rodney Sadler. It's a lot of Reverend Doctors. I'm in, the, I'm in the company of some great folks. Reverend Dr. Rodney Sadler, who's the Associate Professor of Bible Union Presbyterian School and Associate Professor at Mount Carmel Baptist Church. Okay, we are grateful for this presence. Dr. Sadler's teaching experience includes uh, biblical languages, Old and New Testament, uh, wisdom literature in the Bible, the history and religion of ancient Israel, and... African American biblical interpretation. Um, and he frequently also lectures within the church and community. A round of applause, please. <laughs> Next we have Heather McTeer Tony. Please join me in welcoming Heather McTeer Tony, Senior Advisor of Local Government and Environmental Justice at Moms Clean Air Force. All right. Previously, Ms. Tony served as the Regional Administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency Southeast Region for the Obama administration. Let me tell y'all, she did some amazing work. Came into a, they, they did these sessions that made me feel like I needed to quit my job, but I was doing a go work on environmental justice. So at the EPA, Ms. Tony was responsible for protecting public health and the environment in eight southeastern states, as well as the lands of six federally recognized tribes. She was busy. She was also the first African-American, first female and youngest mayor of Greenville, Mississippi. That's right. Next up, I would like to introduce Reverend Mariama White Hammond, the Associate Minister for Ecological Justice at Bethel AME Church. Yes. We clap for that. <laughs> Reverend White Hammond was born and raised in Boston, and having been involved with the project Hip Hop Highways into the Past, History, Organizing, and Power, I love a good acronym, okay. throughout high school and college. Uh, became its first executive director, well, not the first, but it became its executive director in September of 2001, where she will still serve and is recognized as a bar fellow in 2009. Uh, Reverend White Hammond is currently pursuing, pursuing a graduate degree at the Boston University School of Theology. Oh, she finished that. Oh, well, she has it, so come on. Somebody get around the clock and have it. We're not pursuing it, we got it now. Next up, I, we are thankful, so thankful to be joined by Reverend Leo Woodbury. Uh, Reverend Woodbury, who has an extensive hist history of combating racism and promoting justice. Reverend Woodbury has long worked to address issues of environmental racism and climate justice, first working with the African American Environmental Justice Action Network in the 1990s to organize community members against mercury contamination in fish and waterways from pollution from coal burning power plants, okay? Because that's the work we really need to be doing. Now, Reverend Woodbury has also served on the steering committee of the People's Climate Movement and is nationally recognized as an environmental justice leader in the black community. Y'all give a round of applause for Reverend Woodbury. All right, and last but certainly not least, I am so pleased to welcome Reverend Lennox Yearwood Jr., who is the president and CEO of the Hip Hop Caucus, y'all. Reverend Yearwood is a minister, a community activist, and one of the most influ look, one of the most influential people in hip hop political life. Okay, he works tirelessly to encourage the hip hop generation to use its political and social voice. Reverend Yearwood is a national leader in engaging young people in electoral activism and it's working. Y'all give a round of applause for this amazing <laughs> thing. No, I don't need this mic, but just in case. Okay, so first, um, we're gonna jump into this. So I just wanna jump right in. Um, in many ways, you know, the faith communities approach issues of stewardship and, con and conservation from a different perspective than secular pro-environment groups. So what specific insights make that perspective powerful? One, two, in your answer, I would also love if you can talk a little bit about what environmental justice means to you. Who's gonna kick this thing off? Okay, Reverend Carroll, Reverend Dr. Carroll, come on. 
We're going to grace us with your thoughts first. I think um, the environmental justice uh, for the African American faith community, I think, um, is the center issue, one of the center issues of our time. It is an opportunity. Um, it, it's definitely an opportunity to get back to some of our core belief systems. I think it is an opportunity to dig deep uh, on what theology is all about. Uh, theology is God talk. And what does God have to say about the ecological realm? Mm -hmm. And ecology is about everything. We all need one another. And I think that where we are as a nation, uh, it's really about people coming together. Um, it's about our communities really being able to unify. I think that the theology that we have lived with has been a theology of division, of I's and U's, of blacks and whites, of rich and poor, and that if we're going to make it on this globe, uh, that we're going to need to come together. Absolutely. So, uh, Reverend Dr. Harris, you are very passionate about creation care. And so, what specific insights from that perspective, one, are different from the secular pro-environmental movement, and then how, how is that, how is your perspective that much more powerful than your approach? Um, it, this is a, a, a wonderful question because um, I just recently had this question, a similar question posed to me by an oppressor where the um, journalist asked uh, how, what was the history of churches and faith communities working on environmental issues, and to, as if to suggest that this is not in our purview. And um, so uh, I recognized from that that what he was made, the point that he was trying to make was uh, that we didn't have any kind of historical clout. With this. And I thought about that as he, uh, my, in my response was, you know, I think that if, uh, and I say this all the time, if I think if somebody like Martin Luther King or uh, some of the uh, other faith, uh, faith leaders of the civil rights movement were alive today, this would be a central and a core issue also in their work because this is what it means to be alive <laughs> on planet Earth. Uh, if we uh, continue on the, at the rate that we're going, if we continue to uh, destroy um, our environment and to exploit it at the rate that we're going now, we, there will be no place for any of us. And so uh, when we come to it as, uh, from the perspective of faith, um, you know, faith gives us, a little, gives us the opportunity and the resilience and the ability to have hope in, uh, in, in times like these when we have uh, a suggested 30% cut to a budget uh, when we know that that budget probably needs to be doubled or tripled uh, in the first place. Uh, when we have uh, a context where, uh, you know, in, in the context of denial from the highest places and for, corporate, for the purposes of corporate greed, um, I think uh, faith, what, what I bring to it, what faith leaders and faith, uh, people of faith can bring to it is that sense of hope and that resilience to stay in the fight, no matter how long the fight, no matter how tough the fight, mm -hmm. no matter where the fight takes us. That as people of faith, we know that we're responding to something greater than ourselves. Um, Micah 6, 8 says that we, uh, that we should know, let me say it right because I'm not going to quote it properly, because <laughs> I'm, I'm a paraphraser, <laughs> but, um, but Micah 6, 8 says, no, the Lord has told you what is good. What he requires of us is this, to do what is just, to show constant love, and to live in humble fellowship with our God. And so um, that's the call. That's the bottom foundational call of all faith communities, to love mercy, to love kindness, to do justice, Amen. to live for justice, to create just communities. And so uh, as a person of faith, we bring, uh, and, we, and, we, and I think we just had a conference recently where we had the opportunity to see uh, persons who are in the session of work of environmental, uh, environmental work be uh, refreshed and revived because mm -hmm. they came mm -hmm. in contact and in conversation with people of faith. So we, we have work to do there also. So uh, we're passionate about it because we know that, the, that ultimately, if we stay the course, we're going to win. Say that. Say that. You talk that. So, Ms. Tony, in, in your work, talk to me a little bit about how previously when you were at the EPA, when they were still about protecting the environment, because um, I'm not sure what they do now. So when, when, when you worked at the EPA, they were still about 
type of environment. T talk to me a little bit about how, how faith communities played a role. Because some people would argue, I've heard people tell me that the environment is not a, that's a, that's a, that's a young, white, college kid issue. And as though it doesn't, it's not an issue that affects communities of color um, and, and hits us first and worst, actually, in, in most instances. So talk to us a little bit about your experience and marrying these two. So when I was a little girl growing up in Greenville, Mississippi, and a member of New Hope First Baptist Church, right. <laughs> somebody knows what I'm talking about. There were two groups, two people, or one person and one group that I was concerned about. And I'll just go ahead and say it as a seven-year-old, afraid of. Mm. My mama <laughs> and the mother's board that sat on the left-hand side of the car. <laughs> because if my mother didn't catch me, then I knew the mother's board was going to catch every single thing that we did. And it wasn't an option. It was a mandatory obligation of respect and who you knew you had to honor. Mm -hmm. And when I came into my role as regional administrator for EPA in the Southeast, which is all of our southern states, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, North Carolina, oh, South all Carolina, of them. Kentucky, and Florida. So that's the AME, the Baptist, the Southern Baptist, everybody. We knew that in order to really connect in terms of environmental justice and in terms of working with groups that had been impacted for so many years, we had to connect with the faith-based faith mm -hmm. community. And it was that connection to what I remembered as a child and my current faith and what I had grown to know to understand that these perspectives were based upon both a, a spiritual and a societal obligation that we had. And it's moved even greater for me in my work now with Moms Clean Air Force, again, remembering my mama and the mother's boy, mm -hmm. that we don't do what our mother said to. Mm -hmm. From a spiritual perspective, though, it, it was a tie-in of our faith and actions. And I think that's what brings us to the, um, the, the obligation of the stewardship and from the perspective of the faith-based community. I think when you're talking about the secular community, yes, they see a societal obligation, but for the faith-based community, it is one where we know that we must do what God tells us to do. That we must be good stewards. If we're to be good stewards over our money, if we're to be good stewards over our body, what makes being a good steward over the environment any different? And so it's that same type of connection that we have from a faith-based perspective to know that, as you said, we're going to win in the end, that we understand by engaging in this work we know what the outcome is because we know the outcome of our faith. Mm -hmm. And when federal agencies and non-political organizations are able to tap into that faith of the faith-based communities, there's nothing that cannot be done with that partnership together. Absolutely. We can clap, we can clap. Clapping is all right, I like a, I like a few claps. So, Reverend Sadler, I am interested in knowing Kind of how, give me some practical ways of which the faith community is approaching, one, the conversation around creation care, and two, the conversation around environmental justice. And so what does this look like in the pews um, of the churches? Interesting question. Uh, how does it, I think the way that it looks in uh, pews and churches is it looks like we're not doing enough, enough with it yet. Mm. It looks like something that we need to spend more time dealing with. Uh, if I can move from practical to a bit of uh, abstracted uh, work here, one of the things I say is I think that we uh, need to spend more time developing a theology mm. within black churches oh. that resonates with the black church. Oh, come on. That gets us to be motivated to focus on these concerns. We need a theology that's immediately tied to issues like why is this important for the African American community? Why are environmental. Uh, uh, the detriments of environmental pollutants more harmful for African American and Latino communities. Uh, a theology that lifts that up, that ties it together with something like from the Hebrew Bible, the concern for the least, the lost, and the otherwise left out, the widows, the orphans, and uh, these other people who are uh, marginalized in society. If we can tie a theology that lifts up the same groups mm -hmm. of people in our own society to this larger issue, it can motivate us to continue to work towards this. I think uh, if we think carefully about the biblical narrative, and we are people inspired by the Bible's story, if we think careful about the biblical narrative, 
It starts off by saying that we are uh, we are Bene Adam, we are mm. the children of mm. Adam, and that right. we come from Adam comes from the Adama, mm. i.e. the planet and the people are related. We are oh, one. Right. We can't have a healthy group of people unless we have a healthy planet uh, from which to base it. So in essence, if we can begin to recognize that, the health of our communities is intimately tied to the health of our planet, I think we can begin to translate that in ways that inspire mm -hmm. black church preaching all the more. So we need a theology. I like that. The theology is God talk. So we need to develop a theology about why this is important to our community. So, you know, Reverend Whiteham, and you were, you were newly um, degreed. <laughs> and so we talk about different strategies, the way that the faith community approaches this conversation. Um, talk to me about the development of this. We're going to build off what Reverend Sattler just noted. So talk to me about the development of this theology. Like, how can we actively connect this to our communities? I mean, we have, we can look at Houston. We can look at Florida. I mean, we have real live examples right now of where our climate change is real. And we are seeing today examples of what happens uh, when uh, we're, not taking care of our, we're not taking care of the planet and the planet revolts. So yeah, so I think uh, building up off of what uh, Dr. Sadler said, um, so it's important to know my title is I'm the Minister of Ecological Justice and not Environmental Justice. And the reason that is the case is the environment is something that is external to us. Um, it's something that we may interact with. But ecology really actually talks about um, the relationships between the living um, beings on the earth. Um, and so there are a number of things, I think, even within particularly Christian theology, which I know well, um, that I find challenging that have also contributed to getting us to where we are. Right. Um, so if we're talking about handling something external, then, you know, maybe we don't have to deal with it. But if we consider ourselves part of the creation, mm -hmm. there were six days of creation. Mm -hmm. God didn't say the specialist day of creation was the sixth day. <laughs> At the end of every day, God said it is good. So then the question is, from where did we derive the notion that we have the re responsibility or the right to treat the rest of creation as if it is boo-boo and we are the principal mm -hmm. species, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think some of it is really helping us to ask some deep questions about how we've even looked at our own text. Um, and then I think when we look at it as an ecological perspective, we ask about relationships and what is not right in our relationships. And so there's a lot that's not right in our relationships within the human species. Um, I would say it derives, um, the, the environmental issues that we see derive from the same mentalities of hierarchy and domination that is also corrupting what's happening Amen. within us as a species. And so I think part of our responsibility as a faith community, I'm involved in all the other things, I'm working on a solar bill, and I can talk about wind power, and mm -hmm. you know, waste, and all of those. All of those practical things are very important. But the fundamental problem is that there's a way that we have thought was okay to treat other forms of life, yeah. even those that look just like us with slight shade and hair barriers, Talk. Um, that wow. is not okay. Mm -hmm. And it's our responsibility to say that is not okay. Amen. And I will work with a lot of different people, but there are definitely people promoting solutions for this environmental crisis that, to me, build on the same structures of injustice that I would like to see obliterated. Come on, come and so on. I think when we talk um, about it, for, especially in our community, the same reason we think it's okay to lock people up in dehumanizing situations that turn them into not who God has called, God has called them to be, but even more violent creatures because they're by themselves for 23 out of 24 right. hours for a day. Those same ways of thinking are what have gotten us to this place ecologically, and if we don't shift those ways of treating life, all the life that God created, then I don't see how we get to a kind of planet or existence that is worth living um, and that we become worthy of the space that we take up yeah. on the planet. So I think starting from that place of what is really the problem, then allows us to ask what are the solutions and how do we see the connectedness uh, between the fact that you know folks are using substances to deaden things that are happening in themselves. What is the way that we say, how can we restore you by getting your feet 
in some of this earth Talk. and putting some plants in the ground and seeing how they grow and then asking the question, could God not restore me in the same way? There's all these different things that become connected when we see the bigger picture and not just think that it's like somebody threw trash on the ground or it's just air pollution. There's a deeper cancer that's within us that we need to address. Come on, come on. Brother Whoopi, are you an activist? Um, he's like, yeah, mm-hmm. You're an activist, Reverend Woodbury. So talk to me a little bit about what role can faith communities play in reaching groups that have been underrepresented in the environmental movement or environmental decision making? And also in that answer, if you could speak a little bit to, you know, what messages um, have you seen that break through to communities that look like us? And so the, fo so the folks, you know, in this room can take some of these, you know, best practices from you, if you will, and go back to their own communities. Um, first of all, I, I think we need to look at who we are and what we are as, as, as people of faith and not be caught up in this thing where we are, we are declaring our own self-righteousness and, and looking at people as the other rather than another me. And also what, what we need to focus on as activists, um, faith leaders, is, is having a proactive ministry and not a reactive ministry. Amen. So that we need to look at things like uh, preventative health measures. We need to fight the beast before the beast begins to roar. We have to issue forth messaging that doesn't just talk about the dire situation that our communities and planet are in, but we need to have a prophetic call of hope that lets people know that there is a way out of, out yes, of their yes, dilemma. Yes. And we have to also, as, as faith leaders, realize that our calling to ministry is not behind four walls, mm -hmm. but instead we are called to minister to people throughout the world. And so I, I, I want to share an example. In Richmond County, North Carolina, there's a small community where they have five polluting facilities. And they want to build a sixth polluting facility, a company called Inviva, mm. that cuts down trees, wants to cut down trees in a 100 mile radius in both North and South Carolina. And what they're gonna do with those trees is chop them up, turn them into wood pellets, chip, ship them off to Europe because there's no market in the United States for wood pellets. And the same thing is happening in Africa. And so last week, we, last week we held our fourth annual Global South Summit. There were about 40 people in the room. The majority of them were faith leaders. And what we talked about was the fact that we need to work together here in the United States so that we can have an impact on what's happening with the climate, mm. when they burn these wood pellets in Germany, when they cut down trees in Africa and ship them also there. So we have to realize that there's a connection between all of us and the whole planet. And it started off with a small group of people. None of them well know the concerned citizens of Richmond County never to this day have they received the grant. Just a bunch of people who really love their community and, and the people in their community. Mm -hmm. And faith leaders stepped in from South Carolina into Faith Power and Light, North Carolina National Council of Churches, North Carolina into Faith Power and Light. And last month we took a petition to Governor Ray Cooper with 12,000 names on them, Amen. with 60 organizations rep representing one million people. Oh, wow. All right. Next week we'll be joined by the Congress, uh, the um, North Carolina Legislative Black Caucus for the state of North Carolina. And then next month we'll be hosting an event at Duke University to bring students for. And so what we have to do is activists is come out of those four walls, realize that it's not about ourselves, but I like what our Jewish brothers and sisters say. They have a word called Shezdek. And the word Shezdek means not only righteous, but just. Amen. Because it's impossible to be a righteous person 
if you're not a person who stands for justice. Come on. Thank you, Reverend Woodbury. So, Reverend Yearwood, you 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 like the the environmental club for the hip hop community. You know I like that. You? Nothing wrong with that. That's a cool way to look at it. That's the environmental plug. You can take that one. I will. So in doing that, talk to me a little bit about how how do you engage in the entertainment and the hip hop space um, about the about environmental justice, informed by your faith work. How how do you bring these folks to the table? Well, first, Simone, let me just say to you that I am always happy to be in your presence. You are, um, as are we, as are we yes, <laughs> add, add to that, nothing wrong with that, um, because um, it's important to have one, strong sisters um, who are in those positions of media, but also who are connected to our community. We have, we have developed for our generation, and you and I are part of that, a culture where we have moved from being activists to just being commentators. Mm -hmm. Come so on, we come have on. Too many who think that that's the place to be, and they're not linked to any institutions. And so they're not held accountable. And so you constantly, even though you don't have to, you link yourself and make yourself accessible. So I just want to thank you, thank you. for, for thank that. You. Um, Congressman, Congressman, thank you for having this panel. I know your district well, and so I understand why you fight for your people, because um, you understand that 68% of us live next to coal-fired power plants, asthma, and pollution, and so that is not a game. And so I thank you for your courage because in this world, it is not easy to stand up to the fossil fuel industry. Come on. Um, and so I thank you for having this panel and pulling us together. But I, I got to just kind of stop there and just say in the spiritual aspect of this um, that I just want us to join um, our hearts with those who are in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they were without 100%. I've never heard of that. 100% without power in the entire country. Um, children's hospitals are holding on to generators. Doctors were breaking down in the lobby. Senior citizens could not get their medicine. It is a disaster. Barbuda, the country, um, has, is now without inhabitants for the first time in 300 years. Um, my dear brother Hilton Kelly in Port Arthur, Texas is still dealing with the issues of Hurricane Harvey. Folks, we saw senior citizens who cooked to death because they were left behind while rich folk got out on planes with Hurricane Irma. Um, Lee is behind Maria. And then for those of us who are, I'm so glad to see Reverend Deli, who know our African Christianity and link that understanding, saw the droughts and the flooding that's going on, the flooding in Nigeria, the droughts uh, in, in now in Zimbabwe, but the flooding before in Zimbabwe. And even for our, our brothers and sisters who are in, in Asia, um, those who were killed because of the too much snow on the mountaintops coming down. There's a lot going on. If, if ever you wanted to preach revelations, you could preach it right now. And you can get away with whatever, however you wanted to put it together. Um, salary. They can get away with some of the mystiology in that process. Um, but let me just let me say this though. Um, the reality is twofold, um, and I'll get to the part about the hip hop and people's comment music. But I just want to just clear the deck. Um, this issue has always been important to our people. Um, we have always been reliant on the land before we even, before many folks came to this And then those who were here before other folks came here to this land um, understood that and still understood the reason why they were fighting so hard against the pipeline 
and uh, in, at the Standing Rock Sioux and the Dakota Access Pipeline, where they are fighting so hard in Virginia against the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, why our native brothers and sisters understand how we are connected, um, that this truly is Mother Earth, and how we treat our mother. Um, you know, you can't dish nobody's mama in our community. You, just can't. you can do a lot of stuff. You can fire me. You can, you can, you can lead me on the curb. But the minute you diss my mama, it is all the way on. My collar coming off. We going to throw down because mama got involved. So we should have the same thing for our mother earth in that same aspect. But more importantly, it's actually more sinister than that. There are folks who literally sit, who are in the fossil fuel industry, which causes the climate change who make decisions and look at the zip codes and look at where we live and decide to put their pollutions and their toxins and their waste in our communities. The reason why there is an environmental justice movement to begin with is because the larger climate movement didn't want to get into the issue of justice Come for on, our people. Come on, talk about it, talk about it. And so we had to fight from Warren County when they were putting landfills to when they were putting refineries and toxins in, in, up there in Detroit or toxins and marathon refineries in Port Arthur or all over this country. The climate movement decided that polar bears were more important than Pookie. And so in that process, we were left to fight against this along the way. So here we are now, though, in this position where the climate movement now realizes that you can't do it with a Birkenstock movement alone. Mm. And you need everybody. You need black folks, white folks, brown folks, red folks, yellow folks, straight folks, gay folks, theists, atheists. You need everybody to fight this issue. So with that being said, we realize in the hip-hop community that culture was very critical for the civil rights movement. And so today, as a matter of fact, is the anniversary, three anniversary, of the People's Climate March, in which over 400,000 people marched in New York City. And we actually, yes indeed. And we launched People's Climate Music um, with Common and Neo and many others um, to create a soundtrack um, for the climate movement. Um, and I want to get into that, and I want to say two things, and I do want to, I want to leave a teaser for that to get into that. When we did that three years ago, and I went out and worked so hard to get Anthony Smith and L. Varner and Neo, and then tried to, tried to talk to Beyonce, who heard Stevie Wonder at, at the Hurricane Harvey Telethon was laying it down, or Vic Mensa, who was laying it down, that we should not only just get rid of polluters in government, should, they should be in jail. I mean, this hip-hop community, this is the work that we've been doing, but the ironic thing that we put out the home album, it was called Heal Our Mother Earth, with Raheem Devine, and you can still get it. And matter of fact, tomorrow we're putting out another song, uh, uh, Here Comes the Sun, with Jeremiah and Anthony Smith, redoing the Beatles song. Mm -hmm. That comes out tomorrow, but in that process, nobody in the climate movement didn't listen to it, because it was black folks singing which is unique because that's important to recognize because that's a history there as well between civil rights music and folk music. And sometimes civil rights music doesn't get listened to. It gets, so in other words, there's those who sing and then those who observe. Mm -hmm. And so we have to then transcend. But let me just close with this. The one thing I think is important, I had a friend who came to me. He said, Rev, I don't understand how these people could be climate deniers. I don't understand. It just makes, it burns me up. That they can sit here and just not take on the science. And I listen to them and I, and I said, well, I, I mean, I hear you. I understand that. And then I asked them, I said, my friend, no name to be included. I said, aren't you a, you're, you're an atheist, right? He said, yeah, I'm an atheist. And I said, now nothing wrong, I'm with that. I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm a Christian, but I'm not a, you have, you could be Muslim, Christian, whatever. I'm actually, that's fine. But let me ask you something. I'm a Christian. You haven't seen my God. You ain't seen my Jesus. Mm -hmm. But the difference, like you are mad at them, is that if you're wrong, I'm okay. 
But if I'm right and you die, you may have a problem. <laughs> Some of y'all can get that in about five minutes. <laughs> and so the same thing here with climate denial is that even if we do everything and there's no such thing as global warming, our air is better and our water is better and our environment is better. So even if there is nothing and the science, the 99% of scientists who are wrong, even if that's not correct, we still will be better because faith allows me to be better. It causes me to love those who I don't want to love. It causes me to do right and take care of my children. It causes me to speak up and get up and keep fighting. My faith makes me better. It makes me a better person. So even if there is no Jesus and there is no God, I am a better person Come on. simply Come for on. my faith. Come on. You better quit playing. I'm going to take up a collection in a second. Pass the plate, Jordan. You better pass the plate. Yeah. So, okay. So I'd like to know how do we respond then? And I, I want to throw this out because I want to have a conversation about how do we respond when folks say things like, "You know, God's gonna take care of climate change." <laughs> you know, the Lord got us. <laughs> you know, when people from the pulpit. I mean, people from their pulpit are talking about the Lord going to take care of us. Y'all just need to keep coming, keep tithing. And Jesus is going to handle the environment. So how, how do we respond, one, two, how do we keep folks from having those kind of conversations in the first place? So I, I'm going to just throw it out there because y'all are, y'all, y'all are real educated folks. Oh, I'm, I'm just a moderator. Let, let, let me take that because I've preached about that. Preach, oh, wait, well, come on, Ripper, come on, um, take me to church. God sits on the throne forever. God sat on the throne when the children of Israel were taken into captivity numerous times. God sat on the throne when African Americans were taken into slavery. God sat on the throne when the colonizers came. And, and conquered people and exploited resources. God always sits on the throne, but that doesn't mean that you no longer have a responsibility on, to be on, what, what, what Jewish faith leaders call to keep, to keep along, which means to be a world repairer. Amen. That's a cop out, and that's, that's, a, that's someone who does not operate with faith and I say to people, whether you believe in God or not, whether or not you are the, one of the 84% of people in this world who identify as a person of faith, it doesn't matter where you go or where you don't go. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And if you can see a better world, if you can see us having the victory, despite who is in charge, and who occupies the Oval Office, then God sits on the throne, but we also have a better world. Amen. 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 Go ahead, Papa. I knew you had something for me. No, I just wanted to uh, just say that. I think that argument is a fundamental misinterpretation of the biblical text itself. How so? Because so there are people that will get I know. I'm packing for it. So, uh, so if you look at stories like uh, the flood narrative in Genesis uh, chapter 6 and 6 through 8, you realize that the destruction of the world came about because, not because God was just upset with it, but because of human sin. Mm-hmm. It came about because human beings were doing the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you recognize that, uh, the biblical narrative at its core talks about the responsibility of human beings to maintain the course of the planet. If we look at the last story in the Bible, so that's Genesis, the first story. The last story, uh, the book of Revelation, talks about there being a new heaven and a new earth. Mm-hmm. And the reason there's a new heaven and a new earth is because we destroyed the old earth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you look at uh, Revelation chapter 18, it talks about in a very significant way that uh, human beings, uh, because of their commerce, destroyed the world. The latter part of uh, chapter 18 talks about the selling of human beings, the commodification of humanity as one of the chief sins among the people that leads to the destruction of the world. Wow. So if you look at the biblical narrative itself, the court narrative suggests that human beings have always been responsible mm-hmm. for the, the things that have gone wrong and that God is going to step in, but God steps in with us. I love uh, one quote. If you ever hear me anywhere, you always hear me say the same quote, so forgive me. Uh, 
Dr. King, progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability, but only comes about by the tireless efforts and persistent work of those willing to be co-workers with God. In essence, we all have a job to do, and we can't sort of shirk it off and say that we don't have anything to do uh, with this, uh, this tukuno lam, this repair of the planet, because God will take care of it. No, God wants us involved. I often wonder if on that great getting up morning when we get to heaven and I finally get to see Jesus and ask him, you know, why were the homeless people living under bridges and why was it that black kids were, uh, were scoring so much less than, than white kids in schools and we didn't do anything about it and why was it that we allowed so much suffering in this world? God, was gonna, God would say, you know, uh, you know, you were waiting on me. I was waiting on you to do something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think we have a responsibility to play in this repair of the world. We've got a responsibility to recognize, and we've got to recognize both our complicity in the way that the planet gets destroyed and our responsibility in the way that it can become uh, re-restored or uh, the cre a new creation can come about. I think that the other key thing, is, and I would say specifically for those churches, um, if I came to that pastor and said, I'm not going to pay my tithe because God is going to give us electricity, I don't, think, <laughs> I don't think they would use that same logic. Um, we all believe that we have a responsibility to respond, that God gives us a gift, but we have a responsibility to respond. Um, and so I think... You know, and I've certainly heard this. And I've also heard the folks that are like, great, the end times are coming. Let them come so Jesus will come back yeah, sooner. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and my push to them is, will Jesus want to hear what we've been doing if we have been unfaithful yes. when he returns? So even if you believe he's coming faster, I think you might want to get on the job right now so you have, will be worthy when that return when comes. I don't know when that time is. But either way, we have to be faithful. And I think the, the piece around sin is really key because, you know, I don't know how many people have seen the movie The Story of Stuff. I highly recommend it. It's free. It's only 20 minutes. We showed it in our church a number of times. The way we live is a sin against other people and the rest of God's creation. And at some point, you have to ask, even though we may not see it, Right? We don't see the children living on top of dumpsters and mm -hmm. heaps that mm -hmm. we sent over there because we don't want that trash in the United States. So we have sent it to Nigeria. Um, we, don't, we may not know the people that get cancer because of the pollutants for the things that we bought that we did not need in the first place. But the reality is, once we are made aware, then that sin is something that we then become willfully engaged in. Amen. And then we're accountable. Right. So I think some of it is also helping us to look at the effects of the decisions that are being made by our governments and also by us as individuals and even in our churches. People know, you bring some styrofoam in my church, you are going to get a side eye. Come on, you know? come on, um, come on. But, that's, but first I got to help you to understand what that styrofoam is so that when you go to the grocery store, even if it's 99 cents, you recognize you are basically picking up pollutants mm -hmm. that once you put them in the trash, somebody's going to live next to them. Mm -hmm. And once you can help people to see it that way, they will spend the extra 49 cents, even if they're annoyed at me for making them spend it, they'll spend the extra 49 cents because it is our Christian duty Amen. to not send trash and pollutants to somebody else. So, Reverend White Hammond brings up a really good point. She says she doesn't let folks come to her church with styrofoam. So what are some and I, I find that interesting. I think of all the um, the, the fellowship church hall yeah. after church yeah. dinners I've been to where we drink out of the white styrofoam cups mm -hmm. and then we come to like, the heavy sugar crunch. crunch. Right, and we got a sugar punch, which is a whole other thing. <laughs> so what are some of the other like practical things that churches and pastors and congregations can do? Like we, we could just ban the styrofoam cups. But what are some other things that we could incorporate into our, 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 our daily lives um, as we're also out there being activists as we're, we're organizing, we're doing the petitions, we're changing laws. But what practical things can we do in our everyday lives in our churches that we can do this time? So, you know, I think that's an excellent question and it leads us to, to action. Which is piggybacking off, off what we just talked about. We have to realize that we're in a relationship in our faith. This is not one-sided. Mm -hmm. This is not God do everything and then we sit on the sidelines. There's a relationship that we have going on. And one of the things that we found that the church was very helpful in doing with us is, is a discussion we had uh, about a year and a half ago on food waste. 
So we talk about these church dinners that we have, the, the bake sales, the Mother's Day dinner, the Sunday dinner <laughs> after church, you know, the choir, uh, the choir dinner that we have, and how much food we waste. And this food, where it goes, is it going into our landfills? Mm-hmm. Are we putting the styrofoam cups uh, in, into places they don't belong? How can we as a community just do this one simple thing of learning how not to waste food? And we had a, a summit on this um, in EPA and utilizing, again, uh, our sources and our resources uh, to, to talk about these issues, I think it's certainly something that the church can jump onto, and it's something that when we had the first summit in Charleston, South Carolina, it was the faith-based community that actually stepped to the, up to the plate and said, we will take charge because we know the amount of food that we waste in our community. And, and you know, it, it just goes into, again, having this idea of relationship and, and where we came from and the fact that this creation care is the creation care of taking care of all of us, as you said. In our communities, at, at, at least in, in Mississippi, you know, you you don't you didn't let other families go hungry mm-hmm. if you knew that they were hungry. They, yeah. There was no such thing as wasting food because you knew who and how to share with. I had that uh, those family members, uh, you know, it came around Christmas and Thanksgiving. They were making twelve cakes, fourteen pies, <laughs> a whole host of, because you knew who to feed in the community. That's what our mothers did, and that's how they made sure that they cared for everybody. And as a mother today, and, and working with moms, and, and with Moms Clean Air Force, we have a million mothers across this nation. A million mamas. A million of them. We can come together and look at what are these small things that we can work together with the faith, faith-based community. Mothers in the churches to say, okay, we're not going to waste this. And we're going to find ways that we can come together. I think it's a great way to start. Reverend Yerwa, and then we'll go to Reverend Dr. Harris. So I, I guess I want to piggyback on the last question with this question, um, because I think that we're having this conversation, and before we kind of leap to that next step of what we should do from you know, recycling, putting solar panels on our church, which is all wonderful and we should do, I guess I want to take a step back and kind of make sure that we're holding the church accountable firsthand, um, because I think that one of the things here is that sometimes we're not holding our faith communities accountable, and particularly for black folks. Black folks, the church was not just a place where we went to find Jesus, it was a place we went to go find freedom. Mm -hmm. Down by the riverside wasn't just a gospel song, it was a roadmap to freedom. You heard that, when somebody sung that outside the plantation, that meant get your stuff and run down by the riverside. And so the, what we're dealing with now from the 21st century black church has to be a question, and it's not just with environmental or climate justice. Uh, it might be an issue of economic justice. It's an issue of police reform and accountability regarding Black Lives Matter. But why is our church on the sideline at some of the most critical times going on? If the black church rose up right now, and begin to teach our people not even about climate change, but simply about pollution mm. and poverty, and simply begin to have those conversations, not the same sermons every single week, but really get into this and begin to challenge Pharaoh. Because if ever we got a Pharaoh, we Come got on. a Pharaoh Come right on. now. Come and on. so we, I don't understand how we can have a conversation. We have, to be honest, there are some churches that are doing some magnificent things. I know some churches in North Carolina, um, down in the, the, the Bluff community. I know there's some churches down in South Carolina that have done some things. I know churches down in Detroit. So let me not, this is not a, across the board. Don't think that all black, there are some phenomenal churches that have a social justice, that recognize climate justice, and they're doing that. But the same thing, I would say maybe, and it's not a poll, 60 or 70 percent of black churches are not in tune to the struggle of our people. And so when our people and our children are dying because of asthma, our mothers are dying because of cancer, our, our, we're, our fathers are getting diabetes and we're giving them the sweet punch and the, and the, and the, and the fried the fish yeah. and chicken and all that kind of stuff. All these things and even on top of that, that we are allowing our people to die. 
I mean, on one hand, I'm not. I know what happened to Joe Osteen and that whole situation, and I don't want to sidetrack from this conversation, but there's a bigger piece there that when we are giving millions of dollars to churches, the reason why I am here is because I can speak truth to power and not worry about no white man firing me. Come on. That's the reason why I sit here as a black minister. I should not be doing no dance. Or like Dr. King said, I shouldn't scratch when I ain't been itched. I shouldn't laugh when I ain't been tickled. My job and our job as ministers is to speak truth to power, to go to the White House, to go to the CBC if we got to, to go wherever we got to go to and say, this is an abomination. It is morally wrong. Our children are dying. Our people are dying. And it must change right now. So That's the spirit we got to have. So, to Reverend Dr. Harris, before you answer, I guess my question is then, why do, why is the church on the sidelines on this issue in so many respects? Because I'm going to give you some, some facts. <coughs> Black children are five times more likely than white children to have lead poisoning. Truck depots are often located in urban, commu urban communities of color, and people of color breathe 46% more nitrogen dioxide, which contributes to respiratory diseases and heart conditions. 46% more than white people. So this explains why one in six African American children have asthma. And so where, why is the church not forcefully standing up <laughs> across the board on this issue and other issues? Where do we think the disconnect is? And then uh, how can we close the gap? Okay, so you want the truth. Yes, I want the truth. And I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> I want the whole truth. Like truth and nothing but the truth. Uh, the church is asleep. Oh. The church is distracted. The church is uh, about the same thing that the corporate America is about. Right? Um, we have participated and we're complicit in the commodification of all life, uh, and which is radically, radically antithetical to anything that is biblical. Right? We start. We start our story. Those of us who claim the Bible. Right? We start the story of. Our faith starts in a garden with animals, with, <laughs> with botanicals, right? And all of them are related to one another, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the story starts with, let me show you, Adam, what's here for you, right? And, and let, me, let me help you name, let me help you name these creatures, right? Like, like God needed help naming creatures from, from, this, Come on. One, from this one, Come on. right? Or God needed, or God was confused about what would be a good helpmate for Adam. No, that, I want you to see what's valuable to me, Adam. I want you to understand who you're related to, right? Mm. Who's on this, in this garden with you? What, what's important in this garden? And then my, the mandate is care for the garden, right? Fill it, okay. take care of it. And so there's a rat, there's, I mean, it starts in Genesis, it moves throughout, mm. look at Israel coming out of, uh, out of uh, the Exodus, right? Coming out of Egypt, they, they're given a, 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 a Sabbath rule, right? Take care on Saturday, I mean on Friday, in preparation for a Sabbath, right? Take only what you need. There's some principle there. Come on, not extra. Right, not extra, not for tomorrow, not for, you know, 10 years from now, not for retirement, but only what you need for now. Um, also recognizing that not only do you rest, but so does the animal and the earth. They're, they're your neighbors. Ooh, who's my neighbor? Mm. Mm, all of that. Mm. Right, so there's a, there's a radical communal uh, ethic of in the Bible that we have completely lost because we have been, it's been usurped by a, a, a buy-in to what, you know, corporate America, what, um, I, I don't want to name any ministers per se, uh, but we could call it uh, the prosperity gospel, yeah. mm. right? Uh, after the civil rights movement, it came in and usurped and moved, and we have, we're asleep. And so the work is, for all of us, is to go home and wake up our pastor. <laughs> so I was going to come to you, Reverend Carroll. Come on, pop in. Thank you. If, if, if I could, I, I definitely believe that, that, that there's truth uh, to that. The word says, but if my people will call by my name and humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, they'll hear from heaven 
and I'll heal their land. So we believe in renewal. Church folk believe in revival. Ooh. We believe that you can have a second chance. Let me also say that every door that swing open on welcome hinges does not necessarily constitute the church of Christ. This is the United States of America. You can go downtown, fill out some paper, and have your church on the corner. And uh, you're going to be somebody to come say amen. Mm. In the 1960s, when Martin King and the Civil Rights Movement was uh, moving, perhaps the same percentage of churchmen were woke. Uh, it was not, uh, and this is not the way we tell the story. You know, when we tell the story, all of us were marching. When we tell the story of the whole National Baptist Convention, everybody locked on together. <laughs> Come on. We know that Give that was the not truth. the truth. The reality is it was the children. It was, it was those who were faithful to the story. You see, this stuff is not, it's not new to us, right? It's true to us. We do this. This is what we do. <laughs> Somebody going to catch that too. It is visceral within us. We are ecological beings. The reality of the black church uh, in the Western world, there are things that our grandparents knew that we would not consider faithful today. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things my uh, great aunt, she sat uh, in, in, in that mother's board, had on her white, and then she had on her white at the Eastern Star, and if you hurt your foot, uh, she put some old snow water down and put your foot in. There's some things that are connected to the voodoo that we knew and that we stood and we were still in church. We understood the story. And this is true all over the world, in Brazil, in places that we take our, our African reality of being rooted in the earth. And yes, we claim uh, Christianity and we understand it, but we also knew how to weave. And the reality is that there are things that we used to uh, have to hide. We go out, when, when we go down by the riverside, we would do it our way. And today, a lot of us have forgotten down by the riverside. Yeah. Yeah. There are things that mom and them didn't say outside, but now mm -hmm. we've taken uh, 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 a theology that is not totally ours, hook, line, and sinker. And that's why you see us running behind, uh, you know, you can have it. You can get it, prosperity, gospel. Some of that stuff is not really uh, our theology. And so we need a renewal. We need to go back to some things that grandmother, a uh, 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 respect for the earth. My father was an agriculture major because his seven brothers and sisters used to work the land. Uh, uh, he was down. You know, the land was good. They told him to go back to school. And then he started preaching, never went back. And then everybody moved away. Uh, I'm from Hollywood, Holly, Louisiana, down in the woods. <laughs> and uh, we used to go home for the summer, right? I live in California, but we'd get on the road and go home, right? Uncles live in Arkansas. They go home for the summer. We are in generations now that don't know what home looks like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our clergy who are preaching to grandma and them, they've never been home. They've never been connected to the land. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have a lot of faith uh, in the spirit. It is the spirit that connects us. And the reality is that there are a lot of uh, healthy congregations doing a lot of great work. Green the Church is hosting a summit in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, and we're talking about the African American's response to climate change is environmental justice. Yes. And we're talking about the practical things that you can do with U.S. Green Building Council and talking about our buildings. We're talking about going back to the great outdoors, getting our young people back into natural environments. When the California State Baptist Convention uh, in the 40s moved to California, they bought 100 acres of land in Fresno. But then in the 60s, you know, we, we got lazy. We started taking the kids to the hotel in the winter. And now we got 100 acres of land sitting in Fresno, farmland, solar land, and we haven't done anything with in 40 years. Why? Because we are ashamed now about our attachment to the land. Come on. We start talking about the land, say, no, nah, you country. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that those things that we left, people are putting in jars now and selling them back to us. <laughs> All right. Greens from Neiman Marcus. Simone, can, can I assist me telling the truth? Too? I, I was about to ask the, for more truth telling. The problem is on both sides of the pulpit. Because if the truth be known, a lot of the congregants will step outside of church and say, I, I don't feel like I got fed. 
I, I don't get anything. They're out quiet because you're on their pew. They're quiet because you're on their pew. <laughs> but the problem is that that the 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 congregation has to hold the the pastor and the preachers accountable. If 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 you don't feel that you're up, the the key word for us is what minister. So if you don't feel as if you're being ministered to, you need need to do one of two things. Hold the ministers in your church accountable, which may be, oh, oh the camera's on. <laughs> may mean withholding your tithes, or find yourself another church. That's, that's the bottom line. But, but that's the bottom line. It's, it's, that we are only going to be as accountable as the Lord and those that we are shepherding make us. Okay? Because too often we've all heard heard that, right? I don't feel like I'm being fed in my church. I'm not getting what, what I need out of my church. So it's not just the clergy, it's the congregants as well. And if we're, and if we're going to do something about the situation that we're in, and it's dire, and I hope we get a chance to talk about some of the things that seem to be helping us, like solar and tax credits, when if you're a working class person or a middle class person, if you put up uh, solar panels on your house for $30,000, but you never owe the government money, all you're doing is, 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 is putting yourself $30,000 in debt. We need to look at, at, at some things that are going on even with our allies. It's good to say we want mayors and, and councils to declare their cities 100% renewable, but if you're not going to make sure that the municipal that the municipalities that own um, housing projects mm -hmm. and apartment complexes are not making sure that those things are energy efficient, then what we're doing is just creating the same model of injustice mm -hmm. under the fossil fuel That's industry, right. under the renewable industry, where people are heating and cooling the outdoors and paying a disproportionate amount of their oh, income man. for energy costs and keeping our people in poverty. Yeah. And so the thing is that we have to speak truth to power, whether they're allies, whether they're clergy folks, or whether they're Pharaoh in the White House. Mm -hmm. So, y'all just hit on a, a couple good points. And so I, I love that Reverend Carroll reminded us that it wasn't everybody. Because yeah. when we talk about the civil, civil rights movement, we, we always talk about it as if it was everybody. <laughs> So it wasn't everybody, it wasn't every church, it wasn't all the congregants. And so since we now know, we, we were reminded that it wasn't everybody. It was just, it was some of us. It was a lot of us, but it wasn't all of us. So I feel like we're in that moment now, where it's clearly not going to be everybody. But it is going to be some of us, a lot of us. Some people in this room, some folks who aren't in this room. And so how, what are some tactics that the movement can use to organize and build, one. And then two, in organizing and building and using those taxes, not tactics, not just within our own community, but talk a little bit about what Reverend Woodbury just hit on in terms of holding our allies accountable. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, I, I think we are talking about a shift, a fundamental shift in culture that we have to sincerely work on together. Um, we have to work with the lowest hanging fruit who are the churches uh, that find themselves fighting against pollution in their communities, whether it be a big oil bringing coal through the city of Oakland, whether it's pipeline things, who are the congregations that are doing farming and urban agriculture? We have to tell our own story. The reality is yes, uh, we can talk about churches here, there, but until we purposefully uh, bring the ones together and highlight them and spotlight them and tell a unified story. Uh, until we do that, we cannot hold our allies accountable because our allies see us as individuals because we do not see each other, right, uh, as if we are together. And so until we purposefully deal with the silos, uh, we cannot move forward as a unified structure. And so we have to tell a, a unified story. I believe that green teams in churches is an important component. Uh, every church has an usher board. Oh, they always tell me I say that wrong. Every church has a good <laughs> choir, deacon board, trustee board. 
of your congregation, I don't care if you're Presbyterian, Church of God in Christ, Baptist, uh, uh, AME Zion, I, I ain't called nobody's name yet, after Methodist Episcopal, when I call you, just say amen. You're not a Methodist, you know. Uh, no matter what, your church ought to have a green team. And uh, we need to structure ways that you can connect to learn how to build that so that we can begin to change the culture in the church. Uh, there used to be certain things, and listen, there was no internet, there was no plane, but if you went to church, you knew there were certain things you couldn't do in church. Right. And if I went to church in Mississippi and I was from Texas, and uh, Ursher come and put their hand out, I knew it was time to take the gum out my mouth. <laughs> right? uh, they're just things that we used to didn't do as African people that we learned in church. And so until there are real green teams in our congregations that help to set and build that culture, we won't build it on the ground. Green teams, green teams. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to go to Reverend Whitehammer because I haven't heard from her in a second. And then we're going to pop back to Reverend Year, but then we're going to come over to Dr. Harris. So, yeah, so I'm gonna, and I, I think green teams, so I can talk a little bit about that. We do have a green team at our church. Um, we even had two until recently. We now have two now merge into one. So, um, <laughs> I think that um, a couple things, and I think we have sort of four bullet points that are really key in our, our, the work that we do, and I'm, we're not the only people that have them, but this is it. We start from the place of eco-theology, um, so we look at, uh, we have two Sundays a year that we do, Earth Day Sunday, Creation Care Sunday, our Creation Care Sunday is this Sunday. Actually, if you want to hear it, you can, we, we, we live stream Bethel Amy Church in Boston. Um, and then um, do sometimes also do other things. So for instance, we had Hurricane Katrina Remembrance Sunday on the 10th anniversary to remind people and help people to keep making those connections. Um, and, and we actually track that something ecological comes up in at least half of the sermons that are preached in our church. Um, it doesn't mean that the whole sermon has to be focused on it, but when you go through that sort of panoply of the end of key issues and we need to deal with the president, Jesus, you know, we want to make sure climate and ecological issues are just up in there with everything else so that people see them as connected. Um, and then we do a lot of work around connecting people with creation because, um, as has been said, we've lost that connection and, and you can't help people to appreciate something that they're not in, in relationship with. Um, so, for instance, we have our, ble our blessing of the pets is on Saturday, and I people were like, I, "People blessing of the pets? You don't know. <laughs> Black people love their pets too." <laughs> and um, we have a good turnout um, at our blessing of the animals. Um, but again, yeah, treating them dogs better than yeah, kids. Don't but again, <laughs> it's the importance of reminding people that God cares about all of this. It's all connected. There's yes. no issue. You can be like, "Oh, God doesn't care about this, so I can just not care." Mm -hmm. um, so then, there's the sustainable practices. Um, about once a quarter, we sort of get out there things that people can do in a pretty practical way. So whether it's an email to the listserv about ways to save water, um, we will, um, you know, t remind people sort of using water bottles as opposed to buying plastic bottles. And one of the things I will say is if there are environmental groups in your community, if you call and ask them to do a workshop after church, I, I guarantee, at least I know from our state, and I, I'm betting in other places, they will jump at the chance. If you can uh, say there are going to be 10 people in a room, and we don't have to recruit them, we just going to tell them to come to the fellowship hall after service, they will come out. We've had people come and do free energy audits. They even brought out the scheduling device so that people could sign up for the audits right there. So you don't have to do everything yourself. You have a captive audience. You can call people and say, we need you to come this time. And then the last one is the policy engagement. People have to see the connection. So we do, for instance, we have solar panels on the roof of our church, but we had enough roof space to be able to donate 50% of our energy to low-income folks in our neighborhood. But because of changes at the state house, our project went from being our entire roof of the, of the sanctuary to just a little small piece on the fellowship hall. And what we found is most of our legislators from, who voted for it, because I believe this legislation was probably written by the utilities, um, included provisions that legislators actually did not understand the effects of those provisions when they voted on them. And so we had a legislative briefing this past Tuesday to help them understand how the church was not able to fully fulfill its mission because of what they voted on. And it's the first time that the Black and Latino <laughs> Caucus in Massachusetts has ever sponsored an environmental bill. So using that experience, 
we started doing things when we hit the roadblocks and we asked the questions about why these roadblocks were there, and then we had to have an equity conversation. Now it's been hard, because they wanted me to sign on to this large 100% renewables. I'm not against it in theory, but I had to sell, tell the larger community, on this last bill, you let my people be thrown to, thrown to the wolves. So it's our turn this time. Mm -hmm. I want you to put the solar equity for all bills first. It won't benefit everybody, but it will benefit our community because until we see ourselves in it, you are, you're not, we're not gonna roll out and fight for things right. that we get let people. Come on, come on. So I do think that this is really important. We've got to challenge our communities, but we also have to challenge those people who are saying, oh, the earth is burning. Well, our communities have been burning for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I need you to see that our liberation only comes when we are also willing to lift people out of poverty and say that all human beings deserve access to the best that we're creating, not just those who can afford it. Now somebody that snuck up on the end of my panel. <laughs> and you know, I, we, we, we can't let you come sit on the stage and not share with us. Top of the afternoon, everybody. It's good to be with you. Great to see you. We only have a dozen or more things going on at the same time, which presents a challenge. But <clears throat> uh, we, we've got to keep working on environmental justice. And this, this second coming together is so very, very important. I, I want to thank uh, our uh, uh, colleague Don McKeachin for doing what he's been doing and we've got to all keep it up and <clears throat> these two brain trusts go together quite well mm -hmm. uh, they complement one another they're not competitive uh, nobody's trying to score points but what we're doing is seeing that if we take and boil all this down, <clears throat> we're going to be able to do a lot more than we've been doing. And as everybody knows, the church and its leadership figure into this in a very powerful and mighty way. Uh, I remember uh, when I started out, where you would see me and uh, C.L. Franklin's church, right. Charles Adams' church, uh, Jesse J. McNeil's church, uh, and it went on and on and on. Uh, and it still goes on. I, I uh, try to keep in touch with all of those folks as much as we can. So, uh, Madam Moderator, uh, these organizations that are here, Lennox Yearwood, wow, and, and the, the co-founders, uh, this, this is a very, very important one. And, you know, <clears throat> when I started out, that's the first support I got. Well, I, I did get labor support as well. My father was an international representative for the United Automobile Workers. He, he was there at Chrysler when there wasn't any UAW. So uh, this coming together like this, and we're going to be going around, and I'm going to be inviting many of you uh, in the Hip Hop Caucus and other places to, to join us uh, in not just swelling our ranks, but empowering ourselves to get things done. We just don't want to be another big organization that, uh, that is keeping some of the smaller organizations uh, out of the loop. We want, to, we, we want to use our strength and our numbers in a way that would uh, make everybody proud of us. And so it's, it's in that spirit that I'm so honored uh, that you're here, uh, that I'm here with you, and you all have been working with me. I want to thank everybody. And we're looking, 
when we get through with this, we'll be trying to to uh, synthesize this all down to some uh, to do this and and start moving so that it's not just another exciting panel at the forum and uh, and that's it. I'll see you next year. No, sir, no, ma'am. We're we're going to be. Uh, taking our potential and moving it forward as effectively and as fairly as we can. And thank you for allowing me to make this intervention, Madam Moderator. Thank you. Y'all give it up for Congressman John Hyman, Dean of the House of Representatives. So with that, I think we're going to open this up for some Q&A from the crowd. We want to make sure, I'm sure some folks have some questions. Jamal? We've had a really, oh. Can I kind of add one thing you might not, you might not know? Oh, tell us. So, um, one, I've been mentored by some amazing people. Um, I was very blessed to be mentored by Dr. Dorothy Hype. Mm -hmm. wow. And I was also, when I was a White House intern, I was very much mentored by Congressman John Congress. And, and that love he showed me as a, as a young person. And it's been a road. I mean, a road where this is such an important part that I want young people to hear when they see where we are. I was a young intern at the White House, and Congressman Conyers then said, you can come and let me grow. And then, literally through that process, when I would begin to do different work, if I was writing an article on this issue, we're going to Keystone XL Pipeline, or on other issues, I would call Congressman Kynes and say, can you co-write this article with me? Mm -hmm. I hear the dean of the CBC, wow. and he would say, I would add my name. Let's, let's write that together. Mm -hmm. Let's fight the Keystone XL Pipeline together. Let's, let's fight against pollution in Detroit, or let's do these things. And these, we wrote several articles together on the environment. And then further on that, it were times when I don't share a personal story, is that I was a former Air Force officer, and I was fighting against the war in Iraq, and so I, this is my mentor. And so the anti-war movement, because he was the head of the judiciary at the time, he was the one who had to call for impeachment and other things. And so the anti-war movement, sometimes didn't understand because they were mostly white and they were like, well, we have Congressman Collins, you should know. And so we all went to get arrested and we had to sit in and we looked at this thing, it was sitting in in Congressman Collins' office. <laughs> so we went and we were sitting in and then we were sitting there chanting, stop the war, stop the war, end the war in Iraq. He came out and says, is that Yearwood? <laughs> uh, and I said, and I'm sitting out there, you know, we out there chanting. I'm trying to actually duck him, actually. I'm still chanting. He said, come in my office for a second. So I went in his office, and he says this. And it's the most important thing that I think we understand. He says, I'm so happy that I'm in my position here, but you're in your position there and the streets and the suites. I need you to make your voice heard wow. so I can do my job. Wow. Now, the police will come and arrest you because <laughs> I got work to do. But you can always come back to my office. <laughs> so I love Congressman Conyers and thank you for your mentorship and your love for all these years of my life. With that, I'm going to open it up for some questions. We have some microphones out in the crowd. All right, where's our first question? We'll go right here, and then we will go to you, sir. In our role as leaders in the church, whether we are ordained clergy or persons in the pews, we all have responsibilities. As your uh, leadership has been so aptly demonstrated today, what would you recommend to us as the next step? Knowing that for many of us that will be contextually determined where we are serving, 
but what it would be the simple next step that we could take that might have the greatest impact on the total picture? What is the single greatest, if y'all got the answer to this question, we need to pack it up and sell it. But really, what, is the, what, are, what are some tangible, maybe not the single best, but if y'all were going to give you a top three, what are top three things? Reverend Sapp, Reverend Doctor. Rodney's fine. Uh, I think the first thing I would suggest is that uh, it's important to begin to develop relationships with activists who are actually working in the larger community. And the more that we can <coughs> begin to develop networks, <coughs> excuse me, fusion networks that bring people together from the religious community, from the secular communities, uh, find out what they're working on, find out how we can partner with them in that way, bring them into our work, and develop a larger cadre of people. The more we can do that, the more effective we'll be. So I'd recommend that that would be a good starting point uh, for the, the future kinds of work that we're trying to accomplish. Uh, hopefully we can form large enough coalitions so that we'll be able to have a, a significant impact. You want to pop in, Ms. Tom? Sure. I, I think um, it's important to start local. If I were to, to say three things, um, it's easy for us to look at the big, large, let's go solve climate change, uh, let's go look at all the really big picture items and get overwhelmed. I would encourage everybody to start local. Um, there are, right in a local community, there are lead issues in schools that the church can galvanize around. There are uh, community issues dealing with manufacturers right in that local community. So I would say identify areas right where you live, where you're breathing the same air as every other uh, participant in that congregation. The next thing I, I would think of is to say, um, Take the fight to all of the bodies of power, not just focusing on the Capitol or just focusing on uh, the, the local offices, but look at the public service commissions that oftentimes come and get folks to come and testify on issues, but they're impacting the people right there in that community. Um, look at what are the, the, the boards that are governing a lot of these energy sources that are right there in those local communities. And then, you know, right with some organizations, with Moms Clean Air Force, for example, we have a creation care Bible study that is for evangelical moms that we put together just so we, could, just so we can get out to this particular group. We're looking for our mothers that are in the church, and we have a Bible study designed just for them. And it's an already put together plan that you can pick up, take to any church, and sit down and go through it and begin to teach creation care. And... and key in on, on mothers. Um, these are little three things that anybody can pick up and do today. I would like to also suggest that we um, you start with educating ourselves about the policies and the laws and the rules um, that, govern, that are governing uh, energy policies and environmental issues in your state. Um, as I started doing that, I recognized that Virginia was an extremely regressive, mm -hmm. had regressive policies and that uh, you know that that and that that's it's not something that can be uh, addressed by an individual basis or one institution, and so that that means that that collaboration with uh, other institutions, secular and uh, advocacy uh, organizations, but also um, I realized that part of the work that I could do as a person of faith and as a theologian was to bring that to a to the seminary where I work. So if we're going to make change, uh, uh, drastic changes, we're going to really transform um, how our government and how our community and culture sees this issue. Uh, we need to start with, even if, with the training that we do with ministers. And so at Virginia Union, at, at the Proctor School of Theology, we are uh, engaging we're, through um, conferences and through classes and through um, uh, panel discussions this issue so that we can begin to create the room and the space for some of those who are already doing this work to have uh, you know more um, uh, capacity to do that work so I think um, starting with learning our where you are learning the policies um, and then um, implementing some things at home you know we haven't talked about the things 
when I started um, doing this, I, it started with just recognizing that I could do simple things like recycling and or reusing or just living more simply, right? Just thinking about the role and responsibility that I have in creating, uh, you know, uh, garbage and trash and uh, and uh, throwaway, you know, and not being part of a throwaway culture. Rethinking what it means to be. Uh, responsible for not just me, but responsible for the earth and for my neighbors. Yeah. We'll go to this gentleman right here. He had a, not our next question. We'll get the microphone for you, sir. Thank you. I just want to thank the panel for such an awesome presentation and all of those who put this together. Um, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb. I don't think I have to go far. I think everybody in here probably knows or heard about the creation story. You know, God created man, male and female, in his own image. He also said he gave a command to multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over it. Now obviously somewhere we must have misinterpreted that command because we got a panel up here today talking about environmental issues and all of the things that are going wrong. So, people who say to you, um, who use that when you talk talking about, well, God said, you know, subdue, so you know, have dominion over you. What, how did we get that mixed up? Yeah. What, what is, <laughs> how did we get so mixed up that we got to have a panel up here yeah. to talk about that? Uh, thanks for that question. I'd love to pose it. Um, and in, in, even with the last question, like one of the main things that I think about as a practical theologian is the most necessary thing that we do is spiritual formation. Too many times we get so caught up on the issues. And the reality is there are a lot of people doing this work because they know that it's necessary work. But revolutionary work is spiritual work. And there are too many, even of our young people, out in the streets trying to do this work, but we're doing it on spiritual fumes, right? Um, you think about the Civil Rights Movement, the reason that it was able to grow and flow because uh, folk had been in Sunday school, Baptist training union, <laughs> worship, right? It is the fundamental thing. It is, there is a God, right? Do you know him? Do you know God? Do you know her? Vishra. Is God a reality for you? Because if we don't have that, right, then we, in, then we reinterpret dominion as I can tear it all up. But that says that there's something, there's a disconnect between you and the creator, right? Because my mama had dominion over me. Come on, somebody. Come on. Uh, thank, thank you, and thank you for that question. One of the things I'd say is that narrative in Genesis 1 is potent and powerful, particularly when we get to that part where we talk about subduing the earth. And oftentimes, people have utilized that as a mode of saying, we can do whatever we want to with it. God gave us this power. Yeah. If we're careful to consider the narrative, one of the things it shows, uh, it says that we're supposed to, that uh, Genesis 1.27, that we're created, that Selimel Elohim, in the image of God, according to God's likeness. Yes. Uh, and if you look carefully at that larger Genesis 1 narrative, it talks about what God is like. So God creates things in order. God is an orderly God. And then God, after everything God does, uh, says it's keto, it's, it's good. Uh, in essence, the point of this narrative is to show you the type of God that we're supposed to be in the image of. And if we are those who care for the environment the way that God does, God shows great care for the larger environment, great care for the world, this is the way that we are supposed to be in dominion of it. Yes. With great care, with great consideration, yes. with great uh, goodness, uh, with great order. And I think that if we get that in focus, if we get that back in balance, I think we'll be in a better place of utilizing that story. Because you're right, it is a pregnant story for helping us to do the right thing with it, yeah. instead of going to uh, allow ExxonMobil to do whatever they want to with the planet because it's God gave us the authority to do so. Thank you. I, I think too that when we look at part of that scripture, there's a word that's always left out, 
It says to do the earth and have dominion over it and everything that flies in the air, swims under the, uh, under the water, crawls on the earth, be fruitful and multiply and replenish mm -hmm. the earth. Mm -hmm. That's it. We're not That's supposed good. to be using up everything. Yes. We're supposed to put yes. something back. Yes. And so that, yes. That's a word that's always left out of that scripture. We're supposed to replenish. We're not supposed to be using up the earth and its resources in a wasteful way. Amen. Absolutely. I think we have a special guest that just joined us. That's Come on, on the stage, young sir. This is Congressman Cindy Hoyer, everyone, of Maryland. Please come with us. Give him a round of applause. And so today, we have been talking about um, you know, care for the environment, the role that the faith community can play. So please, we would love if you just spend a few moments with us. I'd love to do that. That's why I came. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're done. Done with Donald. Not only is he physically a big man, but his influence is large in the Congress of the United States. He's brand new, but not brand new to legislation, not brand new to making things happen. Don, I'm always pleased to be with you. You know, I got into politics uh, when John Kennedy ran for president of the United States. I was then at the University of Maryland, and I got very excited about uh, President Kennedy. And in uh, January of 1961, he was sworn in as President of the United States. And part of that inaugural address, which was, uh, I think, one of the most inspiring addresses, as opposed to the most negative uh, inaugural address I've ever heard in my life that was given uh, last January. Do I hear an amen? Amen. I'm a Baptist, you know, and I expect a little bit of a Make sure you, the, you know, the congregation is awake. <laughs> I'm not Simone Sanders. <laughs> this is Schwanza Goff. You ought to know Schwanza Goff because she is the first African American woman to be a floor director for one of the parties in the House of Representatives. And she's doing it. She runs the floor for us Democrats. Any event, Kennedy in 1961, very cold. Uh, to most of you are too. Way too young to remember this, I understand that, but uh, uh, cold January day said, let us go forth to lead the land we love, asking his blessing and his help. But knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. Genesis 2.15 says this, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to till it and to keep it, to till it, and to keep it. It is our responsibility. And now we have somebody uh, at EPA who thinks EPA ought to be eliminated. Now, I don't know how many of you have children. I don't know how many of you have grandchildren. I have four great-grandchildren, and they're expecting their hip hop that's me, <laughs> to make sure that the air they breathe, the land they play on and work on and walk on, and the sea and the water absolutely essential for their life, yeah. is fit to survive. That's what I understand the purpose of this breakout group is. First of all, let me say, as I say every, every year, this is the most impressive legislative issues conference held in Washington during any year that I've been in Congress of the United States, which has been for the last 36 years. I want to thank uh, the panel here. I don't know all of you, but I know all of you are expert, very well informed, and will give us very good, powerful information, which will empower us to do God's work of tilling 
and protecting Amen. what God has given us. So I don't want to stand in the way of you hearing more from people who know what they're talking about. I knew me, I just, you know, yap, 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 one of those politicians. <laughs> but I thank each one of you. Now I'm going to have one, one last subject. You may not think it has to do with the environment, but it does. And it's called the Affordable yes, Care Act. You know, I tell some of my Republican friends, I have those, I have three grandchildren and four great-grandchildren and three daughters. The three daughters are no longer in school. Uh, you wouldn't be surprised at that. If they were, those great-granddaughters would be pretty young moms, wouldn't they? Uh, and they're all going to go to school. And there's going to be a child in front of them, there's going to be a child to their right, there's going to be a child to their left, and a child behind them. I may not know any of them, but I want all four of those children healthy. Right. Because I know, and you know, if they're not healthy, my great-grandchild is not going to be healthy. That's right. We are in this together. And your health is important to me. I hope my health is important to you. Because I may come over there and shake your hand. I may even give you a hug. <laughs> I'm going to do it now. She seemed like that wasn't too bad of an idea. The Republicans have a bill on the floor next week. I think McConnell says that. That takes away the protections that Obamacare, as they like to call I love what... Uh, President Obama, you say, says they're going to call it Obamacare right up until the time it works. <laughs> All right? They want to take away protection for pre-existing conditions. Now, Senator Johnson, oh, no, 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 no. You must carry. You've got to get insurance. He doesn't say anything about the cost. Doesn't say anything about the cost. Yes, pre-existing will be conditioned will be uh, included, but guess what? It's going to cost you three, four, five, six, seven times as much, and people will not be able to afford it. Mm -hmm. right. They talk about these block grants. Block grants are simply a Republican way of saying we're going to cut. No. No. Exactly. Don't fool yourself about these block grants. And by the way, some of these Republican senators say we trust the local officials. Local officials are going to take care of you. Hey, hey. Hey. <laughs> And they talk about states' rights. Some of you are old enough to remember all the talk about states' rights. We are one nation, one people, indivisible. And those four children I talked about in front, left, right, behind, my, great, my grandchildren or great-grandchildren, guess what? They may come from any state in the nation because we're a very mobile society. So I want every American healthy. I want every American to have access. They want to cut $175 billion out of Medicaid. That's for the least of these. God says reach out to the least of these. Not shut them out. Not forget them. Not push them away. So I'm pleased that you're in this room. I'm pleased that these experts are here uh, with us. Uh, telling the faith community because the faith community is not a partisan community. It's not a political community. It's a community committed to the values that make any society great, our, our country great, but any society that maintains its values and cares about its brothers and sisters and teaches its children and the health, keeps the health of its people mm. will be a society that will be successful. Amen. And that's what this is about. Amen. And nobody has a greater responsibility than those of us who understand God's will must truly be our own. Yes. Godspeed. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator, 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 before you go, Senator, before you go, I have a quick question for you. Um, yes, sir. <laughs> So it's always a pleasure to see you. I'm now, you know, I'm. Yes, sir. Good to see you. All right. Always a, ple always a pleasure to see you. So one of the things here that I think is so important, you can see this amazing display. Um, 
of people of color who are, who are concerned about the environment. And one of the things that happens there, we were discussing that sometimes the larger climate movement um, sometimes doesn't give the respect to people of color who are doing this work, doesn't give the resources, the infrastructure. Um, and I think that sometimes there's even a green movement and an environmental justice movement. And I think with your position, if you can go back and go back to even some of those who are the big greens and say, listen, we have to have an equity movement within our climate movement so that we are not only lifting up those who are look like us, but there's a whole community of black folk and brown folk and red folk who are fighting for their communities. And we not only must talk about them, but give them the resources, the infrastructure, so they can fight this battle too. Give it to their churches, not just to talk about it, but they can do it and not do with us leading them, but us, them leading us. Yes. I could not agree with yes. you more. My presumption is the CBC Foundation could not agree with you more, which is why they have had this panel, because they understand who suffers most by the degradation of the environment. The people who are stuck in their environment. The people who can't get away on some airplane to fly to some nice place that the air is clean, the water is clean, etc., etc. And they need to be engaged. And not only do they need to be engaged, but we need to be focused on those areas which are most at risk, which is what you're saying. And the environmental community needs to make sure that uh, people, whatever they look like, whoever they are, whatever their wealth, whatever their race, whatever their national, people are included in fighting for their environment. No, Locally, you. state, national, and yes, one of the most stupid things I have seen, I've been in Congress 36 years. I've seen a lot of stupid things. <laughs> Withdrawing from the Paris Peace Accords, not Peace Accords, uh, Climate Change Accords, was one of the stupidest things I have seen. It doesn't make a single bit of difference. All it says is the United States apparently is not as concerned as all the rest of the world is in making sure this little globe you know, Jerry Brown's the governor of uh, uh, California. But he was, uh, many, many years ago, the governor of California. Yeah. And he talked about this little spaceship Earth. Yeah. Now, we think of it as, you know, it's a big place, right? But in the scheme of things, you look at God's creation. <laughs> we are a little tiny globe yeah. with about this much air, water, and atmosphere that keeps us alive. I read that quote from Genesis. We need to keep it as God gave it to us. We haven't done that. And we need to re-engage, and we need to re-engage all of us. Because all of us, not just some of us, are adversely affected. Great question, great objective. No, thank, thank you very much. God bless you. We've had church today, haven't we? Yes. That doesn't get you out of going on Sunday. But I do want to extend my thanks to our, our whip, Stinny Hoyer, who's... Uh... You grew up with me, Doug. Ah, okay, so you know some stuff. Okay, so we need to talk later. <laughs> but I want to extend my thanks to our, our whip, Stinny Hoyer. Uh, he, on a personal note, he's given our office and this congressman every opportunity to succeed. So we thank you very much, Steady, for all your courtesies that you've extended to us during this time that we've been in the Congress. Thank you, John. Thank all of you. I will, um, <laughs> Simone, thank you for being here with us. Not to this distinguished panel, uh, I thank you all for being here. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I came we got to close it out. Yeah, right I, I came all the way from Florence, South Carolina to make two requests of the CBC. Please. The first one is, in light of the fact that the utilities are moving somewhat more with renewables and getting subsidies, would you please look at the possibility of 
moving some of those subsidies from the fossil fuel industry to um, industries that will, um, for research and development, so we have more efficient solar, pa um, solar batteries, storage batteries, and those sorts of things so we can get more fossil fuel. And, and, and the second thing is looking at the current rate structure in this country that is based off three things. The first being uh, the cost of utilities operating, the second being the cost of, en uh, of energy, um, and the third being the, what, the u what the rate user has. So the first thing is, if you're closing coal-fired facilities, it doesn't cost as much to run a solar farm as it does a coal-fired facility. So that rate needs to change. Amen. If you're buying less coal, because it doesn't cost money for sunlight, then that, that rate needs to change as well. And if, we, and if we're going to have um, distributed um, energy resources like smart thermostats, timers on, on, uh, on uh, water heaters and stuff like that, so uh, consumers are not using as much electricity and fossil fuel, we need to do something about that rate too. So if you guys would kindly look at the subsidies that can go towards development uh, uh, to help renewables and also looking at a new rate structure that's more equitable. We can get more money into our communities. We can have people who are less impoverished. And as my good friend Mustafa Ali says, we can move from surviving to thriving. Amen. Amen. We will take a look at all those things and we thank you and all of you for your participation with us today. I have been humbled because um, I thought I knew a thing or two but between these last two panels. I've told my staff, boy, y'all got a lot of work to do because we've got some legislation to draft. So uh, they might be bad at y'all, but I'm not. I'll just close with this. Um, and this is uh, more broad than just the uh, environmental space. My pastor on uh, the day after the election, or the Sunday after the election, uh, gave a sermon on how to live in a Barabbas moment. And he, he made it clear that he wasn't suggesting that Hillary Clinton or my party, the Democratic Party, had a lock on Christ, although as a side note, I will suggest to you that Jesus did ride a donkey. That's what he's sure But he made it clear that no political party had a lock on Christ, but he did ask the question, how does 85% of the evangelical community justify voting for someone who's antithetical to the gospel? Mm -hmm. And the point of his sermon was, this isn't the first time that people have been tricked into voting for someone who wasn't in their best interest, uh -huh. i.e. Barabbas. Uh -huh. But what was so powerful, my brothers and my sisters, was this. He ended the sermon by saying, never forget that even in the midst of a Barabbas moment, the seeds of Resurrection Sunday are planted. And I believe that we did some planting for Resurrection Sunday today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Thank you for being with us.